I am delighted to welcome you all today to Impact Media's first, our inaugural conference. Uh, welcome to our conference delegates from the UK, from the US, from India, and welcome to our funders as well, Churchill Fellowship and the Rank Foundation. This conference has grown directly out of my Churchill Fellowship, an amazing opportunity to meet and learn from impact media practitioners in the US, India, and Sri Lanka, and to meet funders there as well, which is something we'll talk about later in this session. Today's conference will look at how we in the UK can learn from those countries, and we'll hear from speakers based in the States and India, as well as in the UK. So, I'm delighted to welcome our very first speaker, Martin Wright. Martin is chair of the inspirational magazine, Positive News, which is a UK magazine based in Scotland. And Martin will tell us a little about the work of the magazine, as well as giving us an introduction to what's going on in the UK with Impact Media. So welcome to you, Martin. Tell us about yourself and about Positive News and about UK Impact Media. Thanks so much, Caroline, and um, hello, everybody. Um, so, yes, Positive News. It's a magazine, it's a website, it's a, a slew of social media initiatives across all the main social platforms, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn, etc. cetera. Um, and our focus is on good journalism about good stuff. What do we mean by that? Well, the sort of stuff we cover, it's inspiring stories of people creating change in their communities, initiatives tackling everything from knife crime and male violence to restoring wildflower meadows and reinvigorating local crafts. It's about inventors and entrepreneurs creating solutions to the climate crisis, which also lift people out of poverty and improve their quality of life in the here and now, that sort of stuff. Why is it needed? Well, I think the vast majority of mainstream journalism, and this has been my experience working basically as a journalist and editor of the, about the last 30 years or so, the vast majority of that journalism focuses on bad stuff, on things going wrong. You know, for many journalists, it's not really news unless something's being blown up or somebody's being shown up. You know, the old phrase, if it bleeds, it leads. Now, we need journalism like that. We need to hold power to account, if you like. But I think if that's all that it does, it's actually giving a bit of a skewed view of the world because it doesn't report on things getting better. Whether those are things getting better on the global scale, like, for example, uh, the huge number of, the, the huge reductions in the number of deaths from malaria among children in developing countries, the huge reductions in the number of people killed by typhoons in Bangladesh over the last 30 years, or whether it's stuff getting better on the local, local level, lo local initiatives like cuts in re-offending re in an inner city due to community rehabilitation programs that just don't get, don't get the coverage they deserve. Unless you are covering that stuff as well as all the rubbish that's going on, as well as all the corruption that's going on, as well as all the war that is going on, then you're only presenting one side of the story. And it's a very dark side of the story. And if you're only presenting one side of the story, that's actually bad journalism. You're not doing your job as a journalist. And that's a problem in terms of the effect it has on your reader, on your viewer, because you just leave them feeling hit on the head by doom and gloom in a way that leaves them feeling they can, nothing, they can do nothing about this stuff. It leaves them lacking a sense of agency. So that's what Positive News seeks to, seeks to counter, I guess. Um, to give a tiny bit of background, there have been two incarnations of Positive News. It was set up, first of all, in the early 90s by an individual uh, as a little news sheet. It was quite idiosyncratic. It was funded by a, a single benefactor. Um, she passed away. Uh, she handed on 
positive news uh, almost as a, as a kind of deathbed gift to our current CEO, who was then working for her. Our current CEO is a great chap called Sean Dagan Wood. And he had the vision and the imagination to reconfigure the idea of positive news to be something that is owned by its readers. And to reinvigorate it financially, he set up a crowdfunder. He did a, a, a share offer, publicized on social media with the hashtag own the media and set up a community benefit society, which is a form of cooperative, but it issues shares. And in the end, we had 1500 people, 1500 readers, supporters of positive news who, who bought shares and that effectively gave a platform to relaunch, relaunch the magazine and especially to build it out across all the, all the social media, all the digital channels, which weren't available when it started off. Um, so that's what it is, uh, how it works. It's run by a, a very small team of six people, all of whom are part-time, apart from Sean, apart from the CEO. Um, and it's overseen by a five strong board, including myself as chair. Uh, we are all unpaid. It's a completely voluntary uh, commitment on our part. And we are answerable to our owners, to our 1500 owners. Um, our funding, the way we make it work, where we make it just about wash its own face, is largely by subscriptions. We have just shy of 10,000 paying subscribers who get the print magazine, as well as access to all the, all the digital material. The digital, digital material is all available free. That's our present, present model. We have no firewalls. Everything's available for free. Um, <clears throat> we also, excuse me, we also have something called Brands of Inspiration, which is a partnership scheme for organizations we are happy to take some money from to give them some branded profile. We make it clear that, that we've um, compiled material in association with them. Um, and and uh, they are seen as, as prominent supporters of the magazine. Um, now I talked a little bit about, it's a print magazine. It's a print magazine as well as a digital, digital uh, output. Why is this? Obviously it's cheaper if you just do stuff digitally, if you don't have to incur the print and paper and distribution costs. Uh, for the moment, at any rate, the moment we like having a print magazine, it's, it's tangible. It's something to hold. Look, I'll just pick one up here. Um, here's, one I, here's one we made earlier. It's tangible, it's something to hold. You can give it to people. It looks rather gorgeous, although I say so myself, the, uh, the design, the production values are very high. And it's, it's still easier, we find at the moment, to get people to pay for something that's physical, that's tangible. Um, interestingly enough, the, um, our demographic in terms of readers, a fair proportion of our print subscribers are millennials. Um, there's an idea sometimes that it's only old people who like physical stuff, physical media, young people prefer everything digital, everything virtual. I don't think that's true. After all, we're talking about a generation that will sometimes buy albums, they'll buy LPs, uh, even though they don't have a record player, just to stick the cover on the wall. So I think that partly there is still an appeal of, of something physical. Um, in terms of uh, looking at the financial sustainability, which is something that as, as chair of the board, I'm always having to do. Um, we are exploring a membership scheme, um, separate from the, the share offer, which we've done. Um, it's early days. It's very complicated actually trying to set up a really good membership scheme. A lot of people are doing it. The Guardian in the UK, for example, is well known for doing it, lots of other magazines are doing it in one form or another, lots of other media. Uh, we are likely to go down that route. Uh, we're not there yet, um, but I think that's, that's likely to be part of our, our funding future, part of our publishing identity in future. Um, just to give you a tiny bit of um, uh, figures, as it were, uh, I mentioned we've got about 10,000 print subscribers. We've got about 370,000 social media followers, so we've got a, a reasonably hefty readership. 
Um, and in terms of unique visitors to the website, we have about 1.8 million annually. So we got a decent, decent uh, coverage, decent um, reach. Um, we also do an email newsletter. We've got about 40,000 people signed up for the email newsletter. Um, and we get about a 40% opening rate on that, which we're really, really pleased with, given how much stuff people get in their email inbox. So 40% of those who receive it, actually opening it up and looking at it is quite encouraging. And that's also been quite a good source of print subscribers for us, people converting from newsletter to actually being subscribers. Um, financially, you know, be absolutely straight with you, it's never easy. We just about wash our own face at the moment. We have to, we've got no... We've got no enormously wealthy backers. Chance would be a fine thing. Um, and interestingly, though, during the darkest days of COVID, our subscriber numbers went up quite noticeably. Because I think when, when times are really, really tough, people want to feel there's a better world out there. And if I may, Caroline, I'll just finish with a, a, a lovely little anecdote. Um, we had a, an email from an, a nurse in the NHS and the National Health Service during the early days of COVID when the country was all locked down. And she said, have you by any chance got any, any spare back copies of the magazine? Because I've been taking mine into the room where the nurses and doctors relax, uh, where they come briefly for a break in their shifts in the hospital. And people find it so, so encouraging to read this stuff. And so uh, we, we sent her some spare copies, but also it gave us an idea. And uh, we did, we reached out to NHS um, locations across the country. And we said, if you're at all interested in having copies of the magazine uh, for your staff, for the hospitals, for the healthcare centers and so on, uh, let us know. We got a really big response. So we did a crowdfunder among our readers and supporters and we raised about 15,000, a little more than 15,000 pounds off it, which we were able to put entirely to the, the, the costs of reprinting in some cases and distributing these copies out to, out to the healthcare workers. And we, people were so, the feedback we got was so encouraging. It really made us feel, okay, people could be having a really tough time. They could be under a lot of stress. They could be struggling with a lot of stuff in their day-to-day -day lives, but they still sure as hell want to feel that there is, a positive take on the world out there for them. So that, that really gave us, gave us a boost. I wondered, uh, do you ever get your stories into mainstream media? Because that's one of the things that, that I've noticed in India and the States, that some of the impact media platforms, whether it's rural Dalit women in India or, or the black community in Philadelphia, they're getting their stories from their own impact media platforms into mainstream media sometimes and because the journalists in mainstream media are obviously under pressure as you said to do negative stories they don't have the researchers so it's kind of almost like an easy way to get positive stories in is that do you, do you try to do that or is that not part of your purpose uh, uh yes we do try to do it a bit uh we do get people picking up on stories uh we um to some extent so that that's quite nice when it happens uh, we also sometimes get um, stuff picked up, um, well, we assume it's been picked up because the editorial approach is quite similar to the one we took and it comes out, you know, a month or six weeks or whatever after we did it. Um, you, can't, you can't always prove that. Um, we did have one, uh, I was told by somebody, I, I, I'm not going to say the, the title, but a very large um, UK-based um, mainstream media operation did launch a, a strand um, looking at a more positive view of the world. Um, and in fact, they've stopped doing it now, but it ran, it ran for a couple of years. Uh, I, I won't give the name of the organization because I was told this in confidence. So I was told by somebody who worked there that basically positive news had been their inspiration for, for starting this thing themselves. Um, but you have to, you have to, um, you have to be uh, generous spirited in this business because you very rarely get credit when people pick something up. Uh, so you have to just think quietly, hmm, I think that probably has something to do with us. Yeah, yeah, interesting, that's great. And um, how do you measure social impact? 
and, and is that important for you? Because uh, I'm also going to ask you about whether you get grant funding or whether you apply and don't get it. Uh, but one of the things that comes out again and again with all the people I talk to both in the UK and in other countries is the challenge of measuring social impact. We have that challenge at Together TV where I'm chair, uh, but we've, we seem to have cracked it actually. Our amazing team seem to have cracked it. What, do, you guys, do you guys invest time, money, in doing that or we don't have we don't have a lot of time or money to invest to be honest to be really blunt um so uh things such as that are really really nice to have um but they're not an absolutely essential for producing the producing the magazine and uh producing all the digital content but i think to answer your question there'd be uh, a couple of ways to answer it one is we we have done reader surveys in the past mm -hmm. um and although it is only anecdotal a lot of this stuff actually is only anecdotal. You know, people put, people draw draw um, statistical conclusions from something which is essentially qualitative rather than quantitative. I think in this business quite a lot, and uh, I think it's it, it, people have to be honest about that. Um, but um, stories get picked up. We get feedback directly. People refer to the sort of things that they enjoy in the magazine. And on occasion, people will tell a story about, oh, I, I read this and I got in touch with so-and-so and we started doing that as well, whatever it might be, a, a, some sort of a community initiative or other. So to be honest, we don't have a, a lovely series of metrics saying, you know, 37.2% of people responded to this. And as a result, you know, 14 million pounds worth of something or other has happened directly as a result of positive news. And I would be rather skeptical of such claims if we ever made them. But I think we, we are assured that we, our ripples get out there. I think in an ideal world, it would be really lovely to have the funding to do something somewhat more rigorous and actually see, okay, how can we demonstrate that providing positive news to people triggers positive things to happen? And I'm sure we'd love to do that. And that is a piece of work which would require some kind of funding. Yeah, well, one of my personal challenges to the UK funders, whether they're foundations or lottery or government or philanthropists, is to convince them to invest, to donate money to impact media platforms so that we can spend more money on impact measurement and on marketing and on those, those things that are the, the walls of the house, as David Floyd, who's going to speak later, talks about, rather than just the sort of decoration on the roof. Um, and have you tried uh, fundraising from foundations and philanthropists for any of your work, or is it something that you, you've not gone into? Uh, a small amount, and we have on occasion received a small amount of funding. I think it's something we want to do more of, we want to get better at. And one of the reasons that it, it's enjoyable being part of, in, part of this event, uh, for me, is to find out more about what's out there. Um, because, you know, I would say this is share of positive news, but I think we do a great job. And I think the job we do is one that needs to be done better and more extensively, basically. Well, the, the message I get constantly across the UK is that it's very, very, very hard to get grant funding to support the infrastructure of the organisation. So you can get it for projects, training, disadvantaged young people to become journalists, or you can get it for... For, for projects that are sort of on the side of your core business, but to get funding for your core business is very, very, very difficult. Mm -hmm. We were incredibly lucky at Together TV because we received funding from um, the Golden Bottle Trust to invest in a new database, in, invest in building up our audience engagement. Um, so we, and we've been able to, to do that brilliantly. And if we hadn't had that core funding, it would have been very, very, very hard. Mm -hmm. And that now means that we have an amazing base from which we can not only prove our social impact better, but also start to perhaps raise funds from them as well. I think it's um, an interesting challenge. I think it's an interesting challenge to funders, actually, because you're absolutely right, as with any, any walk of life, getting funding for core activities is extremely difficult. But in a way, the sort of things which a lot of your speakers you've got today are involved with, the sort of things that Positive News does, it's a project of itself. 
by itself, really. So you could imagine if there was a major media organization and they said, we're looking for funding to set up a, a positive news strand as a project, that's the sort of thing which might actually appeal to funders. But when you set things up and that's its whole identity, it might not always sort of tick the right boxes because it might be seen as, as you're asking for core funding, but in a way your core is your project as it were. Yeah, and we, we, we need to do a big campaign here in the UK, all of us together, uh, to convince funders that social impact media has amazing social impact and is much needed in this country. Um, I just wanted to ask you one more question about uh, local versus national or even international, because I understand that positive news is reaching outside the UK as well. I remember when we set up many years ago, when we set up the community channel as a national community TV channel, it's now called Together TV, people said to us, some people said to us, why national? Why, you know, community is local. You should just be doing local TV or things like that. Have you had any any sort of other, do you think there are any pros and cons for positive news of the fact that you are UK wide versus local? I mean, I do personally, I love positive news. And by the way, I love your design. When my hard print copy of positive news arrives through my door box, I get really excited to open it because it's so beautifully designed and produced as are your digital newsletters as well. But anyway, going back, do you see any do you see for you at Positive News having a UK wide, if not an international platform, how does that really add value to local communities? It, it's the, the, um, the strength of good examples, really. You know, um, somebody can be doing something in Yorkshire that somebody else in Cornwall would find hugely relevant to what they're up to. Similarly, people take inspiration, you know, people can be running a community initiative in Tamil Nadu. And actually, although it might be a very different geographical and economic circumstance, people can get inspiration from the way it's run. So we, we, we see ourselves as an international magazine. We're a UK-based international magazine. So while the majority, a considerable majority of our print subscribers are in the UK, um, a, an overall majority of our digital readers, and therefore overall majority of people who read Positive News, are from outside the UK. So uh, sometimes if people are interested in the UK, but people read it in, in North America, people read it in India, people read it in Egypt, people read it in China, we've got a decent international coverage. And I think for some people reading it, it's not necessarily even obvious to them that this is a, a British magazine. Um, so we do make certain assumptions in the magazine. You know, we probably wouldn't say Yorkshire comma UK in a, in a story in the print magazine. Um, but we also make sure uh, that we write about stuff that's going on in a way that is not so culturally specific that somebody reading about a, an initiative in London, say, when they're reading it in India, would struggle to understand it. Fantastic. Well, it'll be interesting for you to hear from some of our speakers later on who are doing similar projects in mm -hmm. India and the States, such as the Better India, uh, mm -hmm. which is, again, a, an amazing mm -hmm. positive Mm. positive news platform yeah um, it is some of the the new aggregator platforms such as url media <clears throat> in the states um i i'm really excited about collaborating across countries and learning from each other mm. on that note martin is there anything else you wanted to add or shall we move on to hear from nafisa now i'm really keen to hear from hear from the others now caroline so uh, that'd be great thank you very much for having me well, thank you so much for being our first speaker at our first conference. We really look forward to working with you in the future and showcasing your work to all our uh, followers as well. So thank you, Martin. And now we'll move on to introducing Nafisa. Nafisa is uh, the co-founder of Muslim Mamas. And I'm gonna jump straight in to Nafisa, who's going to tell us about her, why she got involved in Muslim Mamas, how, what it is, how she became the co-founder and why it's important and inspiring. Okay, over to you, Nafisa. Good luck. Thank you, Caroline. Thank you, everybody. Nice to see so many faces and um, I'm looking forward to learning from you lots. So I'm Nafisa, I'm co-founder and strategic leader of Muslim Mamas. Um, Muslim Mamas provides a network and multiple safe spaces at the fingertips of Muslim women globally to connect, inspire, share and empower Muslim women seeking 
sisterhood and a support network. We're a global community of a quarter of a million people and a media platform for Muslim mothers to be educated, uplifted and given an authentic raw voice to the underrepresented Muslim women by providing quality information, consultancy, networking, events, culturally sensitive co content and growth opportunities. We are currently working at government level um, on consultancy and various high impact campaigns, including topics such as cancer awareness and domestic abuse. We've also worked with many brands offering market research and awareness opportunities, um, as well as insights and have achieved over 70% or more high level engagement rates on focused activities. We do aspire to be the largest uh, global network of Muslim mothers, enabling positive change and impact, becoming the go-to place for Muslim women sharing authentic experiences. So now I'm going to tell you a story of a young mother, barely aged 25 years old, when she gave birth to her first child and faced the unspoken challenges that go with the experiences of motherhood. With her firstborn, Nargis Jahan Uddin had a very difficult pregnancy that required several hospitalizations and uncertainty as to whether the pregnancy will remain viable. In that first year of motherhood, she couldn't understand why she felt so numb all the time, why she wasn't feeling the joys and wonder wonders of motherhood and that she'd always imagined that she'd feel. She was, on, she was with her son every single day and she knew she loved him deeply, but why wasn't she connecting with him? Why was she scared uh, of all the things around her? Coming from a hectic life of studying and focusing on her career, it felt like her whole world had shrunk into, that, into the body of that tiny baby. She rarely went out and her every action or conversation revolved around the care of her child. She rarely saw anyone and all her friends and family were working. She was sad all the time and she felt completely isolated, trapped and alone. In January 2011, Nargis Jahan randomly posted a photo of a sleeping baby with his bum in the air and on her hardly used Facebook profile. It was a moment of sheer frustration, exhaustion and a deep sense of loneliness that propelled her to do this. Within an hour, this experience connected so many of her friends from the various stages of her life all across the world who shared their experiences of their children and their sleeping habits. Suddenly, for the first time, being a first-time mom didn't feel so lonely anymore. Friends from different points in her life suddenly reconnected with her on the one thing they now shared in common, motherhood. This wealth of shared experience, knowledge, and prayers not only connected her, but it also felt like it had validated her. It was this moment that led Nargis to create Muslim Mamas by hitting the create button on Facebook. She invited a hundred of her own friends by then and uh, her invited her friends and so it grew. It was her son's bum that launched thousands of mums and became symbolic of a time of need, her cry for help. She could post at 3 a.m. whilst awake and alone, and she knew there was always someone there to reply. There was always someone there with her. Muslim Mamas was the cord that connected Nargis and pulled her out of the dark reverie that she now recognizes as postnatal depression, where she'd felt so connected, disconnected from motherhood, so disconnected from her own baby even to being thrown what felt like a lifeline by connecting this community at her fingertips. It also became many other mama's lifeline, quite literally, as you'll hear now. So that's how I came to be involved in, uh, involved in becoming a member of Muslim Mamas and then an admin and subsequently a co-founder. After being a member of Muslim Mamas for nearly two years, in 2014, I got a call from one of the admins then asking me to help with a domestic abuse survivor escape with her ch young children and to help find her shelter as her then husband was encouraging her to poison herself. It was now or never. One of the stories that will remain with us forever is this anonymous sister who used to post every month or so. Nargis used to handle the anonymous posts at that time. With each post, the abuse she received at the hands of her husband got worse and worse. She told Nargis that she deleted her messages because he would check her phone and he, she didn't know what he would do if he found out that she was talking. Muslim Mamas was her only safe space to speak. She tolerated so much, including physical abuse, rape, constant emotional abuse, her children being turned against her, being hit whilst being pregnant <clears throat> and breastfeeding, being sworn at and so much more. No matter how much Mama supported her on the platform, we knew that she would need to make that first step and that would have to come from her, not us. 
One day, she messaged Nargis saying that he had tried to encourage her to take poison and commit suicide. He told her the world would be a better place if she took it, and she actually considered it and believed him. That's how much he had reduced her state of mind. That's the day she decided to take action. For the sake of her children, she called the police and reached out to us, and that's when I got the call. We had to now be part of an escape plan to help this mama escape from a volatile and dangerous situation. Admin needed me to call my father to help her find accommodation as he had access to various organizations in Birmingham. Um, and admin managed to drive her and her two very young children to a safe place and find emergency accommodation that she so desperately needed. All of that propelled us to realize that this platform needed more than the Facebook um, community. We needed to be an organization. We needed to showcase our mama's stories and we needed to find a place that it's um, public and everybody can hear it. So our 10 year last year anniversary, um, we marked that occasion with launching our MuslimMamas.com um, where we now represent Muslim mamas raw voices in their own words. Um, we also have uh, other channels such as a podcast. We've got a VIP lounge where we um, provide opportunities for education and courses for our mamas to benefit from and also to upskill themselves. Um, in terms of the immediate platform itself, so although we didn't envision it to be at the next BBC, we did envision it to be a parenting space like Mumsnet or Bounty, where you have a global network for Muslim mothers. They're often looked as undermined and misrepresented, and yet they are powerful vehicles that propel society. So creating this safe space on our website would, would help express their voices, would show their diversity, intelligence, and validity in what they were saying, that the world in general was not really hearing. So our website is now the public face of our closed spaces, um, and we will represent the authentic Muslim women's voices in these places by providing courses, training for them. They could upskill themselves, be empowered, and be able to just even get a qualification or change their careers. Um, I'd like to conclude by emphasizing the need that we do have to represent underrepresented women's voices by sharing their stories, by empowering them, by giving them a voice. In order to do this, media platforms need to be scalable, uh, need to have scalable opportunities as otherwise the impact isn't as far and wide. Why is it that despite all the work that we did in lockdown with our mamas was never heard in the mainstream media or recognized? By having more platforms that amplify these stories, word will get out. We need to have these we have we need to own these conversations i founded a podcast channel um not another mum pod under the muslim mamas umbrella for this very reason i wanted to have honest and candid conversations we hear mainstream writing about muslim women and talking about us for us for us all the time i thought why not grab the mic from them and let us talk about us our lives what we go through firsthand in our own words why don't we start that conversation ourselves and start talking about these issues that our, com our community likes to brush under the carpet and figure out a solution for ourselves? I feel enough is enough. If we want our voices heard, we need to be the ones making the change and ensure that these there are plenty of these platforms where we can be heard and we have to create these opportunities ourselves. Yeah, so, that was fantastic. Bravo, bravo, bravo. And I love some of your phrases like, why not grab the mic? And, it, and we've got to be the ones to, to make our voices heard. Really, really inspirational. Um, so questions to Nafisa and also to Martin, please, about anything you've heard or about, and also about the general thing about the importance of scaling. Has anybody got any questions? Because if not, there'll be plenty of other times. So Rizu sent congratulations, Thank Nafisa, you. on your growth and amazing work. Thank you very much. Uh, Nafisa, I've got a question for you, sure. um, which is, uh, you've just recently won the amazing Facebook incubator. That's right. Uh, prize to, so that they will, they will train you and scale you up. How much is Facebook going to be your platform? And how much is your website going to be your platform or your podcast or anything else? What do, you know, I think there's something that we all struggle with, which platforms should we prioritize and how can we find the money to prioritize all these different platforms? 
a, a really good question because that's exactly what we're doing on the Facebook right now. One of our initiatives is to develop a multi-channel strategy. So I wouldn't say just focus on one platform and don't do another. If you can, just try and build as many platforms as you can, as many channels as you can. When we had that social media shutdown, when Facebook went down and the whole world went a bit crazy for that one hour, everyone of Muslim Mamas community could go straight onto the website, onto our VIP channel, and they were communicating on our private room rooms there so it, it's not like we, we had a disconnect as such and that's when we realized more than ever that you should have your own space whether you, you know Instagram Facebook podcast they're all different mediums but have your own space that you own that you can control as well so I think websites are definitely the way to go to make sure you have that but social media is so powerful now um, thanks Nafisa there's a question from Padma who's in sure. Bengaluru um, sure. who's going to speak with us later speak to us later do you have a whatsapp channel and did you consider that or tele or telegram or signal no the, we uh, intentionally avoided that and the reason why and, and we actually have a blanket rule on that we don't allow whatsapp groups on our uh, safe spaces simply because it's not that safe um, we don't know whose numbers are being passed around. We've got a lot of cases where women are vulnerable. We can't allow that kind of uh, safety compromise and we don't want to be responsible for anything that might happen as a result. But when it's on our safe spaces, um, you know, it's fine. We can monitor and we can also support them as and when. Thank you. That's great. And I've got one quick question, which is sure. uh, here's, here's a, actually there's other questions coming through. So from uh, from Rizwana. Media, media monitoring, how do you monitor, mediate conversations with the new online safety harms bill platform such as Facebook, you will have to monitor content? And have yeah. you had got examples where that's got out of control? And yeah. then a, similar, a similar question, well not similar, but another question from Grace at the Bureau of Investigative Journalism in London, which is doing amazing work. Um, and she wants to know how much your growth is coming from the community itself. Um, and how much they're a tool for growing your audience be yeah so the first question in terms of um you know adhering to facebook uh, standards etc facebook is really clear in terms of the violations that you have they have really good standards that you need to follow um and even though best will of the world we can't control every single post that comes through and we might not get that quite um quality information that might be fake news and etc cetera, etc cetera. um it does get uh, a violation tick and and facebook tools also monitor that back end but we also have an active admin we've got active moderators who are monitoring the conversations members themselves can report uh, on the Facebook tools they can report uh, comments that are not appropriate or information that's being passed that's not really verified so there's a lot of work that goes on in the back end of things and um, we haven't really caused any major violations at this stage despite being you know um, going for what 10 years now <laughs> yeah um, and Grace, uh, you asked if in terms of whether the growth comes from the community itself. Yeah, 100%. The members are always inviting each other. Um, they will be recommending us. And in fact, Muslim Mamas was a secret group for the first few years because we couldn't cope with the waiting list and, and the number of vetting that we do as mam mam uh, Mamas are being added. So um, we were secret and it was invite only. So we actually grew invite only. We've got a currently 24,000 members in our main group. We've got 150,000, no, 130,000 on our main Facebook page in our public spaces, 20,000, uh, 18,000 on Instagram. So yeah, most of it is coming from the content that we're providing, but also members, adding members. Nafisa, there's so many questions. We could spend hours talking to you. Um, I think we'll, we'll come back to you if you can sure. stay on a bit longer. No problem, uh, I'll be here. I put next in the agenda just to talk to you a little bit about my findings from the Churchill uh, Fellowship that I that I did. And I'm gonna whiz through those because this, this the talk is much more interesting in a way. Um, I, I went on the Churchill Fellowship to find, to look specifically at funding models and organizational structures in the US and India and to see what people were doing to grow and scale impact media. In summary, I found that across those two countries, those continents, impact media is a really, really powerful force for good. 
It's very vital in those countries, much more than in the UK, and it's a powerful driver of social change. The, um, the other thing that I found was that the, the vast amount of funding, income rather, coming into impact media in the States and in India is a mixture of huge amounts of individual contributions, donations, community shares, membership, subscription, all sorts of different kinds of individual contributions, plus big, big support from foundations, philanthropists and impact investors, which we just don't see in the UK, and a growing movement towards commercial income, but fundamentally individuals, huge amounts of money from individuals and huge amounts of money from foundations. Uh, the third, my third major finding was how entrepreneurial and flexible the people running, founding, managing impact media were. They have non-profits, they have for-profits, they have charities, they have businesses, they have everything there. And what's great is that the funders, whether it's India or in the States, they're not saying, oh, you're not a registered charity, so we can't give you any money. Or they're not saying, oh, you're for profit, so we can't invest in you. Or they're, or they're saying we can't, we'll, they are very, very flexible about focusing on the core purpose and the social impact of these platforms and not worrying enormously about the structure or the governance even, or the, or I would say, can't wait to hear from Vince in the States about this. Um, but that's what I found nearly everywhere I went, less rigid, more flexible, more entrepreneurial. And I would love to see that here because I know that some of you in the audience, George Brock, for example, uh, we've, we've, all of us, we've come up against enormous blocks if we're not a particular kind of structure here. Um, so my recommendations for the UK in summary are one, we need to together come together to inspire foundations, the lottery distributors, philanthropists and impact investors to support impact media, not just independent news, but also platforms that are storytelling platforms, photography, magazines, podcasts, etc. And key to that support that we need to get is support for core funding for things like a database or technical costs or the manager's costs or the marketeer's costs. Um, we'll hear from some of the others in a minute about that. Secondly, my recommendation is that we should grow individual, try and grow individual contributions to impact media in the UK. We should try and invest in growing donations or community shares or membership models or even social entrepreneur models where you're selling mugs and t-shirts or something more practical um, and subscriptions as well. We should be thinking, how can we do this? How can we scale this in the UK? How can we learn from America and India to do this? And you know, we, we'll need infrastructure costs supported for that. Thirdly, how can we become more entrepreneurial and flexible and develop different structures of ownership and governance? And how can we persuade our partners, funders, supporters that it's fine to do that? Can we, for example, have a mix of two or three different companies within one brand, some char one charitable, one non-charitable? Um, and how can we build the technology to support what we're doing as well? Um, my fourth recommendation is that we need to get much, much better, all of us, at telling our impact story, at, at measuring, evaluating, celebrating that impact story uh, and really create that cycle of people recognizing the impact that we're having and therefore wanting to support us as individuals or as institutions or buying our goods or whatever. Uh, we need to inspire the support and the sustainability that we want to have. And my fifth recommendation is that we really do build a network of specialist infrastructure. Again, in America, in states particularly, but also in India, I was so wowed by the support structures that are there. Um, all sorts of different kinds of support structures for impact media, including dedicated foundations that are just funding media, um, but also training, connections, networking, advice, match funding, uh, campaigns, branding, loads of stuff. 
we could do that here as well. And we're trying to do it here, but we can do it more and we can do it better. A big thank you to the Churchill Fellowship. I really recommend you all trying to get a Churchill Fellowship, an amazing opportunity. And also to the Rank Foundation who helped support my fellowship as well. Um, and to all the organizations and people that I visited on my travels. So there's a question from Rizu, is there a crossover between impact media and public interest news? For me, impact media is the wider whole movement of this stuff. So including public interest news, including photography projects, video, storytelling, everything. And I, 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 I resist just focusing on news because I think news is one thing, but all the storytelling is a way to access more people sometimes. Um, and I'll talk about that another time a bit more. Other, other questions, comments? Quick, I've got a quick question for Nafisa. Nafisa, if you could um, just tell us, are you getting any funding at the moment from anyone? Yeah, so as part of the uh, Facebook Accelerator program, um, the whole point about that is they will assess our social impact and they will help support that. And we also, uh, you know, receive funding from Global Giving, which I've already secured $50,000 um, to begin with. Um, and we have further funding opportunities after Demo Day at the end of March, um, where we will be pitching to investors and, and, and funders alike. Um, and we do sustain ourselves. We, we work with, like I said, we work with the government agencies at the moment and we have some sustainability, but I think it, we can't scale at that level. And we really need to think about how we're going to secure our future. Thank you. And um, there's a question from Claire to say, uh, does it, do you mean impact media generally, Claire? Claire, why didn't you ask your question? Where are you? You unmute and ask your question. I, I was just wondering if, generally speaking, um, imp if impact media organisations have ever or would ever um, do a co-production with a standard um, production company on the right project and or with uh, a broadcaster or streamer? Does anybody want to answer that question, Claire? Very important question. I can, I can answer it, but I'd be interested to hear from other people. We've, we've talked a bit. Uh... It's not been able to come to fruition at the moment. It's always rather tricky, uh, as I'm sure you know, but it's, uh, it's always an idea in think, as it were. Great, and Grace, Grace has said she can answer uh, to have an answer on this one. I've also got my opinions too on this one, as you can imagine. Grace, over to you, lovely to hear from you, and then we'll break. Hello, hi, thanks very much. Um, yeah, I'm from the Bureau of Investigative Journalism, and um, we are an impact-driven, mission-driven organization, and we work very much in a partnership model where we do investigations into areas of public interest, such as global health, I'm from the environment team, um, finance and so on. And then once our story is at a certain stage, we approach different partners for it. So we've worked with um, BBC News, with ITV News, with um, a prominent partner in Mexico when we were doing a story about oxygen. So it really, we're quite sort of driven by the story that we have and the impact we want to achieve with it. And so um, we do make those partnerships and actually use them uh, quite strategically in order to reach different audiences and bring about the kind of change that we want to see from journalism. Yes, I will post a link in the chat. Not Grace, thank you so much. That's really, really interesting. And what you do at the Bureau is absolutely amazing. I'm just wowed by it. Our, our reporters, uh, we've got about 14 reporters now, live in the neighborhoods or are from the neighborhoods where they cover. And then they cover each ind individual area as if it's its own small town. Um, you know, so they they cover everything. We don't have a transportation reporter or an education reporter. Each person covers all the news within their borders because Chicago is a city of neighborhoods and people have strong identities with their neighborhoods. So we really play up that that I'm the person from your neighborhood who knows what's going on. And that's really what drives our 
just sort of, of our, our model for uh, co individual contributions. Um, we, as media in Chicago has contracted, they, um, the big newspapers and the TV stations have really cut the people that do the sort of coverage that Block Club does. They don't go to the school board meetings or the development meetings. They don't interview the, the, the weird character on the street. Um, you know, they don't tell the fun stories um, that, that we like to do. So increasingly the, the narrative about Chicago that is sent out by the other media tends to be the, the bad stuff that's happening in Chicago. Um, and there's a lot of bad stuff happening in Chicago, but it also becomes a, a, a drumbeat of, of crime, of taxes, of you know, of just, uh, you know, some boring political coverage as well, where it gets into the, you know, not the, not the interesting things. So what we try to do is, you know, we cover a lot of that, but we also really try to highlight the, the good parts about Chicago and the, and the, the parts that we all know make up a, you know, cities have good and bad, and we try not to, you know, only focus on one or only on the other. We try to create a whole mosaic of what being a Chicagoan and a neighborhood resident really looks like. Um, and I think people appreciate that. They, they see themselves in us. Um, we try to be very representative of the neighborhoods that we cover. Like I said, we try to cover, we try to hire people from those neighborhoods. And, um, and as a result, you know, we, we're, we're a hybrid of, um, we have a very, we have a subscription model, but it's a very generous, paywall, I would say about 90% of our stories are free. Um, we don't charge for anyone in, um, in parts of town that have been historically undercovered. Uh, we don't charge for, we don't paywall breaking news or COVID news um, or crime news. So, um, you know, that, that when you don't when you don't put the uh, COVID stuff behind the paywall, that's, you know, a lot of our coverage over the past two years is, every, is everyone's. So, um, so we, we ask people to support us. And um, even though uh, there aren't many um, premium options for us, we have some premium newsletters, but um, what I think they see is they're, they're seeing coverage that we're doing that the, the other papers aren't doing, the other news sites aren't doing. And that's what, um, that's why people come to support us. Um, we, we had a, um, our, our origin story was we were part of a for-profit news site in Chicago. It was called uh, DNA Info, which is just re really a terrible name. Um, uh, but we, we had an owner who's a billionaire who came to town and thought he could um, make a go of it by selling basically just ads. It was a free site, but he, we would sell ads and we would cover the city hyper-local. Um, we did a real good job of creating an audience. We had, our last year, we had about a hundred million views on stories um, in a town of 2.7 million. But ultimately it was a, it was a model, it was a, a failed model that was never gonna work because as folks know who sell banner ads, you just can't sell enough of them, uh, especially in one market. Um, so we had uh, the benefit of him uh, shutting us down with the click of a button one afternoon um, and it left our entire audience high and dry um, looking for the sort of hyper-local coverage that we had been providing on a daily basis. So when we came back, a month or two later and said, hey, we are gonna come back, but this time we're gonna be nonprofit. We're gonna ask you to support it. Um, we had all these people that knew what we could do and had missed us for a couple months and realized, hey, maybe this is worth six bucks a month to keep them from going away. So that was a, you know, a huge part of our membership base was the people who had liked what we had done previously. And um, when we relaunched, we made sure we had a uh, crowdfunding page going already with a video promising it. And, and that was huge. We had about 3,000 people donated to us within the first, within the month of the crowdfunding. And that really helped us uh, get the initial funding we needed to hire reporters and, and get started. And that was about four years ago. We're up to about 18,000 paid subscribers now. 
Um, and um, we're just, you know, we're, we're, we're proud of that, but we, but we try to emphasize that this is a nonprofit. This is a, owned by the public. They're the ones supporting us. They're the ones who we're, we answer to. And that, um, that has worked out well for us because, uh, because they knew a billionaire had owned us, took us away, and now it's something that everybody owns. Wonderful. We've got a question from Martin. Did you say it's six dollars a month per subscription? Right. It's uh, most of our subscriptions are actually annual. Um, they're 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 fifty nine. You can do six dollars a month. Um, we have you know we'll do occasional uh, uh, discounts just to uh, uh, just to the rattle the cage a little bit. But um, uh, we've. Um, that that's basically the, the the going rate is about fifty nine dollars. We we have different tiers and options that really don't give get you anything more. But we we phrase it. Um, I love what I, I I love Block Club. I'd like to support it with a little bit more. And we have about a thousand of those folks actually pay us a hundred dollars a month just as a extra extra gift. Um, and then we also you know stick out our hands every other way possible. Um, we have a donation site as well for tax deductible donations. We, we have some fun with merchandise. Um, if there's a positive news story that got a fun element to it, we will, um, uh, there, for one, there are no alligators in Chicago. Uh, Tracy may have some down in Atlanta, um, or, but uh, one somehow showed up in a local lagoon and we were the first to break that story. So we made t-shirts because it took a week to find the alligator and people were lining the outside of this lagoon waiting for it to be found. And luckily for us, it took a week and we were able to sell 4,000 t-shirts from all the people that were sort of captured by the, the frenzy of, a, of an alligator in Chicago. So we try to get creative with our, our fundraising, but it's usually, um, in the context of this is you, Chicago, we're here to represent you. That's great. That's such, I love the alligator story. It's amazing. <laughs> yeah. I wanted Seamus to speak because he's so entrepreneurial and, and there's so many different ways you can contribute and reasons to contribute. And your nonprofit, would you have a trading subsidiary as well, Seamus? We, we, we are, we are um, nonprofit, yes. Yeah. That was, we, you know, we, it was a, Felt like it was a coin toss in the beginning whether we should be nonprofit or for profit, and we decided it was ultimately would be a better story to 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 tell people. Um, frankly, we didn't think there would be a, 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 a much of a profit to begin with, and we weren't looking to flip the company to a larger seller. So um, the for profit model worked it worked great for us. That was what we were about. We just wanted to return and be able to get back to doing the news that, that we had been doing previously at the other company. Thank you. And there's some questions in the chat, Seamus. Can you see them or shall I read them out? Um, go ahead and read them out. I can okay. see them, but- so One from Padma in Bengaluru. Do you have advertisers and sponsors? We do have some um, very limited advertising. We, we didn't begin with any, but um, we had a lot of outreach and, um, some of the cultural institutions in Chicago have come to us to promote things. The Art Institute of Chicago um, is one of our regular advertisers. If they have a new exhibit, they'll they'll put it, um, they'll they'll do an ad, and it's all pretty um, it's pretty inexpensive. And we have a huge reach at this point. Um, our morning newsletter goes out to about one hundred and ten thousand people. Many of them who are not regular news readers, they've we've sort of been converted them, um, yeah. young folks that um, that hadn't grown up reading newspapers. So yeah. Um, yeah. we will take advertising, but um, it's not uh, by any means a central pillar okay. of our. Uh, and one more quick question, and we'll come. We'll hear from Adam, and then we'll come back and do a bit more general Q and A. Did just in a quick sort of um, very quick summary. Did your membership? This Padma asking this was your membership affected from the pandemic, either ne negatively or positively? It was affected, um, uh, our numbers uh, really went up. Um, people, uh, people really turned to us during, the, especially the, the first couple months of the pandemic when, um, as is everywhere, but you know, things were taken away from us on a daily basis. And, and just, we had to keep people updated about what the rules and restrictions were what was happening. So uh, we had, uh, and as I know a lot of news sites did, they saw just traffic really sore. 
in memberships or as people um, look to local news to, to, to guide them about their local restrictions. Thank you. And Bad Marai, sorry I said Bengaluru. I know you're in Hyderabad because I visited you there. So, so we, yes, Hyderabad. We've had. Uh, um, thank you, Seamus. That's so interesting. We could hear you speak for hours. So let's go to Adam, but stay on and we'll do some more Q&A with you, Seamus, after Adam, because Adam runs a local initiative called the Bristol Cable in Bristol in the UK, in the southwest of England. Adam, are you there with us? Are you ready here, to yeah. jump in? Yeah, for sure. Lovely. Hi, hi good afternoon, everyone. Uh, yeah, so my name is Adam. I'm one of the co-founders and um, managing editors of the Bristol Cable. Bristol Cable is a 100% member-owned local magazine and media cooperative uh, founded in 2014 um, as volunteers. And we've now um, progressed to the stage uh, up until now be to have um, eight full-time equivalent employees and dozens of freelancers and um, 3,000 paying members who all contribute um, on average about £3.50 a month, so probably around like $5 a month. Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about how I started the thinking behind the cable and actually how it's worked in practice and also our challenges. Um, but I'll just quickly start by framing the sort of backdrop of this kind of like context in which we began the Bristol cable. And as we all know, and this is the world that we're sort of working in, is that, but it has kind of like diverse or different effects across the different regions or places that we are in there's this kind of like chronic sexual crisis within journalism and the ability to find a viable business model for all different types of journalism, national, international, but in particularly local. And as one of the things that we've seen has been the concentration or conglomerization of local media all across the UK, where now 80% of local media is owned by just five companies. And those companies are in turn owned by uh, international asset managers or hedge funds or pension funds from all across the world. And what we see in that is the kind of collapse in quality and viability partially due to this lack of connection to the communities that they're serving but also because of the commodification of news as just something else to invest in rather than something that we see as which is a public service um now there has this has obviously been going on for decades and accelerated in the past decades and covid has made that this chronic crisis an acute one where we have whole areas of the country, cities and towns that don't have any um, decent or any at all uh, local journalism available. So our approach to this in 2014 was looking at this, this framework and this context and thinking what intervention can we make as um, sort of people without resources, um, often without sort of like, uh, a substantial professional experience in the sector and we basically came up with this theory that democratic ownership plus quality and quality public interest local journalism plus community engagement could equal a new business model for local journalism that is viable that is possible and is addressing some of these issues that we see that are kind of like interacting in a, in a, in a negative cycle of trust which is leading to a sort of like departure from uh, people being willing to pay or engage with journalism, which is kind of opening up the space for bad faith actors and fake news and disengagement with the kind of civic and political process as a whole. And so working through those aspects of democratic ownership, public interest, local journalism and community engagement, I'll start with the first. So the first is that we have 3000 members. Uh, and those members are all equal um, shareholders within the organization. So it's one person, one share. And through various different ways, those members can participate at different levels in what we do. So they can participate in steering the overall strategy um, in terms of what we want to focus on for the year to come, editorial focus, voting on different things like campaigns or um, issues that we will um, investigate. They'll also be involved in ethical decisions. For example, um, at the beginning, members help to shape and craft and then iterate on our advertising policy. That is obviously such a, an important source of trust or mistrust for um, uh, many people with the media. And then finally, members are able to elect them, um, put, um, put themselves forward for election to the board. And uh, we have a non-executive board 
that act in a kind of like advisory position that are elected from and by the membership and are from the community and bring different skills and experience and insight to help us steer this community organization. But more than the sort of only the practical tools of people's engagement, this is also about feeding in and feeding back and having a dialogue with the community or what, what I've heard and something that stuck with me is the people formerly known as the audience that is like breaking down the sort of uh, barriers between the community and uh, journalists and it actually being more of an exchange in many respects as rather than a sort of like transactional or one-way process. Um, now that happens in different ways, it happens in, in person, obviously that's been inhibited by um, uh, COVID, but it also happens through experimentation with different forms of participation, digital participation, and we're actually in the process of building a community relationship manager platform software that manages all the kind of like general aspects of a subscription model with also with kind of uh, digital participation tools, forums, voting, polls, that sort of thing, uh, and, and tip-offs and so on. So that's the first aspect is the democratic ownership that is owned by the people that it is meant to be serving. Second is the journalism. Uh, and this kind of like brings me to something that somebody said to me at the very beginning when we were setting up is you can be community owned and you can be a co-op, but if you have crap journalism, nobody cares. And so one of the things that we kind of like have focused on is what is our niche, what is missing from this picture? And in particular, what we saw was missing in locally in Bristol and in many other places was that kind of like longer form uh, investigative features, interviews, uh, data driven history, all of that other stuff it isn't just a sort of like daily news updates. And there's a place for that. And that's important. But what we were seeing is that there was uh, a need for understanding what why stuff is happening not just what is happening what's the kind of like bigger story beneath the daily headlines and in particular as we live in this kind of hyper connected uh, country and, and world connecting the bigger picture with the day-to-day -day experience so how can we connect climate change to people's local experience how can we connect the housing crisis to um, individual and and how that interacts with markets and government regulation to, to how people understand um, uh, their experience of like struggling to pay the rent or to find somewhere for them and their families to live. And part of that is also the sort of like investigative and seeking the impact. Uh, and we've had some uh, uh, important tangible um, impact in terms of changing policies or uh, shifting the needle on the kind of like political discussions, but also about different voices and ideas and solutions and trying to sort of like seek that diversity of contribution too. Um, and that's really important, the solutions aspects is because something you're probably all aware of is this kind of phenomena of news avoidance, where people just feel overwhelmed with the amount of negative or um, uh, sort of heavy news and journalism that's coming their way and feel like, okay, I, I know that this is important, but I'm not really sure what to do with this information. And that can lead to the withdrawal or disenchantment with the overall kind of like process of participating in an engaged way in society. Um, which kind of leads us to the final, final kind of pillar of our organization, which is community engagement, uh, which we do through different ways, um, through training, through play, paid placements for early career journalists, co-production um, with diverse communities, for example, making documentaries with young people or uh, uh, particular localities, and then public events such as around elections where we have panel debates or um, conversations. We have one coming up now on the sort of renting crisis in, in Bristol, and then um, using our digital tools to facilitate that as well. And that's been obviously spurned and, and sort of um, pushed forward by COVID. Um, so that's the kind of like what we're aiming to do and what we have been doing. The challenges are is that whilst the Bristol Cable has been and is seen often as like a success story, the market is basically fundamentally broken to provide this public service. And that's obviously what Caroline was touching on here is that there needs to be some sort of systemic or regulatory change. Like there can be, and that, that supports both um, uh, individual uh, or, or singular organizations to advance that and to sort of push the boundaries of innovation and um, development within this sector. But there also needs to be a, uh, a, a shift 
at a broader level that will enable that and sort of work in tandem with the organizations that are doing that. Um, one of the big things that the UK faces, which you touched on, Caroline, is that there isn't the philanthropy to fill the gap. There just isn't. Our two main funders have been from the US because we cannot find funding in the UK, uh, apart from small um, pockets of sort of restricted funding, which limits what you're really able to do. Um, and then the other big issue, which is related, but not entirely, is the scalability at a local level. Like we have under 500,000 people in Bristol. Bristol's a medium-sized city and we have 3,000 members. And it's the question of what proportion of, or, how, or real number of that fixed audience do we need to get to reach the sustainability? And we are far from that in terms of um, our entire income base being um, from membership alone, although it is a considerable and significant portion. Um, so finishing up, those are resource constraints at an operational level. We're kind of helping and contributing to different conversations that are happening, particularly in, in the UK, around uh, some sort of change to the sort of like market structure that will support that, that is beyond little drops in the pond of funding here, a bit of Facebook money there that doesn't actually change the fundamental dynamic um, and is, is too short term. Um, and ultimately what we will be looking at and want to sort of think about is that how can we contribute to some form of rep replicability or learning across the, the sector that can take elements of what we're doing as we take elements from others, whether that's the co-op bit, whether it's the local bit, whether it's the kind of public interest journalism and come up with a formulation that can uh, 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 survive and thrive within different um, communities and cities and towns. Um, and so and that's really where we are at the moment. We have had a, a success and, we, uh, and we're doing well, but as somebody, a uh, quite prominent person in the sector says at the moment, if in the UK for media organizations, survival is success. And that kind of shows you the kind of like benchmark of what we're working with is like, if you're surviving, then you are succeeding, but actually we need to be shifting the dial so that we're thriving as well. Adam, that was so articulate and so interesting. And uh, questions, the first one from me, which I'm gonna reflect an audience question is, does the money coming in from your 3000 members, yeah. three pounds a month, does that cover your core costs? No, our, our core, uh, that covers uh, 35 to 40% of our core costs. Where do you the get the rest from? The rest of it is from uh, restricted and core funding from various philanthropic and foundation sources. Including the US rather than the UK. Yeah. Okay, I, I, I've got a question while we're waiting for others. This, this session is about how we can grow individual donor income, membership, subscriptions, whatever. Do you yep. see that as possible? You were just talking about the number of the half a million people in Bristol and your 3,000. Yep. Can you, what would you need to grow it? Is it investment in tech? Is it marketing? What would you need to make that grow significantly? <clears throat> um, yeah, I mean, that, that's like a, a big question. I think the, my answer to that, I guess, is a combination of things. And that is a, essentially one without being too hung up on it would be to understand really what is the sort of like viable market because that's that's a total population that can includes you know adults and people who would just never be interested in what we're doing but what we would need basically is to like reach more people persuade more people be more relevant uh into people's lives and that is a bit of a chicken and egg situation where we would need the capacity and capability in terms of our resources and our impact to be able to do that which kind of like brings me back to this other aspect which i mentioned previously in the, at the end of the talk is like we need to be both working on the ground and in the local level and on the operational level but also thinking about what are the systemic problems and challenges that are inhibiting that in the first place like i said i do believe there's a, the, the the market is broken and we will need and if we consider public interest journalism to be a public service then there needs to be some sort of change around that. You mentioned the stuff around charity law. That's something that we're actively um, engaged in a conversation across the sector about changing to unlock even a fraction of the amount of money that's available in other places would be a total game changer that would be the sort of um, uh, enabling 
financing and capacity building for organizations like ours. Unfortunately, we are in a bit of a dynamic where there's a lot of good ideas and a lot of good people trying to do stuff, but they haven't got the runway or the sustainability support to sort of reach that level of organic uh, sustainability. Like we, it, to put it in numbers, we would have to be looking at, it depends on how you kind of like model it, but like doubling, tripling our members in the long term to sort of make it viable, pay people properly, you know, be able to achieving the impact that we want um, in a way that is uh, sort of um, within the resources we have. Okay, I uh, have a quick look at the chat, Adam, while I mm. ask a question to Seamus, because I remember when I visited you, Seamus, which is a long time ago now, nearly two years ago, you had just received three years of funding for a marketing and fundraising person to develop your individual income streams. How did you persuade a funder to give you that core support? To me, um, it really starts as as Adam said. It starts with the journalism. Um, if you're if you're not doing good stories that don't matter, um, it, it's hard to persuade anyone to do anything. Um, it's a, it's a key part of of how we grow our audience too. What we feel like we need to be essential. Uh, to Chicagoans. Um, it's one thing to get a one-time donation from someone, but to get them to want to re-up year after year um, or to resubscribe or however they pay, it's just, it, it's all about the, the stories and whether we're making a difference. And I think that's, that's how we help persuade some of our, our um, larger funders, our philanthropic funders, um, that we're out there uh, making a difference and we're making, um, you know, we're becoming essential. We're filling a gap that other media in Chicago isn't doing. And whether that be um, small local stories that impact a uh, thousand people, um, but we also do some stories that are impacting the entire city um, as well as the, you know, the, the entire nation. We've, we've had a role recently about some, some potential fraud and COVID testing sites around Chicago and around the country. So um, to us, it's, it really comes back to, you know, we're, it was three journalists who started it. It's, it always comes back to the stories for us. If you're, as Adam said, if you're doing not, if you're doing crap journalism, it, it's hard to go far from there. Thank you. And uh, what I saw in the States and in India as well now is this fantastic synergy between the funders understanding the individual income was a big solution for sustainability and therefore they will fund the infrastructure that you need the staff the your marketing and business development person your tech thing and etc to get those individual income uh donations coming in so that lovely cycle of good editorial content that's relevant funders supporting infrastructure and then a fantastic message to individuals um there are other questions we've got about five minutes a little bit more actually about nine minutes for questions so um there's a question from george brock who's a uk uh very well-known journalist in the uk who, who's now been work leading an academic sector george um do you want to just talk about your question about editorial content actually adam has answered that question in the chat so i'm going to take the opportunity of having the floor for a second to say that one of the ways in which operations like the Bristol Cable can improve in the UK context, excuse me for a moment being completely specifically about Britain, is improving the way in which uh, news operations, local news operations, can be charities. We have a charity law in England which makes it extremely difficult for local newsrooms to operate as charities. Not all charities would want, not all newsrooms want to operate as charities, not all of them would qualify, but some of them would. And the organization that I chair, which is called the Charitable Journalism Project, is trying to make this situation better. And one of the things we do is offer legal advice to people who might want to explore registering as charities. So I'm very happy to hear from anyone if they want to take any of that further. Thanks, George. And do put put, put a link to your organization and you in the chat. I shall do and that we'll, right now. This will probably come back again um, in structures. I mean, my my feeling is that you can be very flexible and you need to be flexible. We need to move away from feeling that we have to be registered charities in the UK to be able to get the individual income in. 
Um, I'd welcome any questions or thoughts about that from other people in the both in, outside the UK and inside the UK. Excuse me, interrupting uh, Caroline or coming in again very yeah. quickly, but charitable status assists individual and larger funder donations as well, equally well, if it happens to suit people. Yeah, I think it can restrict other things as well. It's an interesting debate. Well, there are some rules you have to obey, which is why I yeah. say it doesn't suit everybody, but it can suit some people. Yeah, yeah. I love your campaign, though. I think it's so important that the Charity Commission gets it here in, in the UK and Scotland as well. Um, I meant, I meant more, questions to, more questions to Seamus. Somebody was just saying something. Tracy, oh, Tracy. Tracy. hi, Tracy, hi. come in. Hi, hi. Hi, um, hi Caroline. And, and, and I do appreciate what George is, is saying. Um, here in the States, it's been a recent phenomenon for us to um, fund nonprofit journalism organizations. And I'm happy to say that I was part of that movement um, to help get that started. In, in the States, you have a lot of independent, smaller news outlets that are for-profit organizations. And, and, and for a myriad of reasons, um, they have chosen not to become nonprofits. It's not always in their best interest. It may not fit their business model. Um, they may be, a, you know, have, reluctant to have to deal with the paperwork that you have to do to file to become a 501c3. They don't have access to legal support to help them navigate that system. So there are just a lot of reasons why they do not um, go the nonprofit route. And so what some of the foundations are now doing is going they're going through intermediaries I I worked for one of those intermediaries I now run one of those intermediaries and the intermediaries will fund the the for-profit organizations we have to ensure that they are producing um, a public good a pro, you know a product for public good and we assume kind of that burden of making sure that they are adhering to the IRS's the Internal Revenue Services um, rules regarding um, um, public good and, and, and function, even though they're not a nonprofit, they're functioning in that manner. So I just wanted to I wanted to add that to the, to this part of the conversation. That's that's great, Tracy. And actually, you're we're about to start your session when you'll be speaking as well. So um, I just we've got a couple of minutes left. Is there anybody else who's got a sort of very specific question about? the resources, the culture, the ownership models to help us drive individual income in this sector. I'm super conscious that, you know, The Guardian is an amazing success of this, but I know that they invested something like five million pounds, is my understanding, before they even started getting much income in. And, uh, you know, and they're now even still spending a lot of money on it. So what can, you know, any more thoughts, questions to particularly to our wonderful speakers, Seamus and Adam, again, like all our speakers, I'd just love to hear from you for longer. I can add just while we're waiting for a question that um, is to Tracy's point, there really has been a wave in, in the states of nonprofit newsrooms. Um, I, I probably get a call once uh, or Tw you know, once a week at least from from someone, three people with an idea. Some of them had been laid off at their papers, and they wanted to start something. And um, I, and I always recommend the nonprofit route. Um, it is while it is daunting to file for um, not for nonprofit status, but to get tax exempt status is the hard part. But it it is doable. Um, we paid an attorney, um, you know, about three thousand dollars to do it for us, which was a lot at the beginning. But it is you know, it was the one of the best investments we made, and it's the paperwork is 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 not as daunting as it seems. Um, especially you've got a little bit of time to do it if you get a, a fiscal sponsor that could accept donations on your part. Um, to us, it, while it seemed like a nebulous decision at the very beginning, it was um, it was absolutely the right decision uh, for us, and that's what I've been encouraging all these uh, um, upstart places to to do it because um, it, it, there there's a path forward, and and it's 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 absolutely doable. And we've seen just the explosion of, of these small newsrooms all all across America. It's, it's been great. And just a quick question to Adam. You know, you were talking about how you've invested in your, your database and the fact that the database can, can drive engagement. We, yeah. we did the same actually at Together TV. We got charitable funding 
to invest in an amazing database and the people to run it and lead it and everything. So we've built up a huge, huge, huge audience engagement process. We're not asking them for money yet, and we may not, but did you get funding to do that, Adam? Did you get, did you get dedicated funding from a philanthropist or yeah. foundation? So the way we fund that is, uh, well, one, it has been, was included as a kind of piece of uh, work that we intended to do for, from, from our core funding. So it wasn't restricted, but it was part of an application that we made to one of the big philanthropic funds. Um, and then uh, as that kind of like came to an end, we were able to partner with actually a German not-for-profit investigative journalism uh, operation called Corrective. And with them, we've been able to um, partner with them and the Bureau of Investigative Journalism to develop this piece of software. Um, and they've been able to source some funding and we kind of act as basically the um, consultants and originators of the project. And they're working with us to roll it out across different newsrooms uh, in Europe. So it's currently uh, sort of uh, under development and some newsrooms are taking it on board. It's called BAB. Drop a link in the chat, and if anybody's interested in engaged journalism and subscriptions-based journalism, then it's definitely something to check out because the subscription and engaged uh, engagement aspects there's too many overheads, which means it is sort of limiting the ability for people to uh, take it on or limiting their confidence. And if we can find a, a, a credible tool for um, enabling that better, then um, the, the the sector as a whole will be the benefit. That's a really inspirational note to end on. And thank you so much, Seamus and Adam. I'm determined to get you back again for longer, longer times. We're going to now move on to our next session where we have four, and it moves on very naturally, four amazing speakers. Tracy, who we've just heard from, who is the founder and chief executive of the Pivot Fund and, and a very, very, very honored Harvard Schoenstein fellow. Um, Daniel Ash who is Associate Vice President of Community Impact at the Chicago Community Trust. In the UK, the community foundations, and they're represented here today, are quite small. In the US, they're enormous. Daniel was also, um, also worked for, for Chicago Public Media, where he hugely drove individual income. So we could, could touch on that, Daniel, as well. Padma, who we've been hearing from a little bit, is based in Hyderabad in India and is the co-founder and editor-in-chief of the most incredible Suno India podcast platform, which he'll tell us about. And Vince Staler, who I'm so excited to hear, runs this unique thing, which we need here in the UK as well, which is an organization that brings together all the funders that fund media and encourages them and supports them and enables them to fund more. Oh, and the theme of this session, just the theme of this session is all around how can we get more grants, major donors, impact investment, institutional fundraising into our organizations to scale impact media in the UK, particularly. Tracy. Oh. Well, thank you so well, much for having me. I'm honored to be here. Um, Seamus, uh, I live in North Georgia, um, about 40 minutes from Atlanta we don't have alligators. We have bobcats, we have feral cats, we have chickens, lots of chickens, but no alligators. It's closer to South Georgia, closer to Florida. We try to keep them down that way. Um, the, I, I wanna talk a little bit about myself, just a tiny bit. Um, I'm, I have a, my background is quite different from most folks in this space. I started off, um, in circulation and, and advertising. Um, I, I have probably worked in every department in the newspaper. I even slung ink in the press room. So I know the newspaper, I know the news business better than I know the back of my hand. Um, I, I worked my way up and I um, somehow found my way in the philanthropic sector of, of, of media and really worked on one of the first mapping projects to map the, the media ecosystem or the journalism ecosystem in the country along when I was a senior fellow with Democracy Fund. That really, really gave me kind of a, a up close um, embedded view of what was happening in the landscape. And I won't belabor it because we've already talked about how the industry is kind of 
changing and the, the, the number of newspapers that have go, are going out of business have gone out of business. Um, we have hedge funds that now own a number of our newspapers, news, news organizations that have changed hands several times that have contracting and um, laying off journalists left and right. And we saw all of this happening. And, and, and so in the nonprofit sector, we, we understood that philanthropy would have to step, step up and fill the gap um, that has the urgency for that has has um, quickened or hastened because of the level of disinformation flowing around in our in our current information system. And so ph philanthropy now understands more than ever um, that we have to not only um, reach communities directly with credible quality news and information, but also try to figure out how to stamp down the flow of disinformation in our in our information economy. So. Um, I launched what has become known as the Racial Equity and Journalism Fund at Borealis Philanthropy. Um, I did that about two or three years ago. I wrote a white paper kind of setting up that fund. And then I, um, I led it out of the gate and we invested about $7 million into um, 30 independent news organizations run by and for communities of color why communities of color, communities of color are at the forefront of the barrage of disinformation. Um, we also had um, George Floyd murdered and that helped a lot of philanthropists understand um, that they needed to invest in equity, racial equity in particular. And that meant flowing dollars into some of these news outlets that were already embedded in these communities of color that had been traditionally ignored or um, have been targets of harmful information from status quo news organizations. Um, and then COVID happened. And so that happened right after I released the, CERP, the, first, um, the first pool of dollars um, to these outlets. And right as I released those dollars, advertisers began canceling their um, their run dates with these newspapers. So the money actually came right on time and we, realized once again, philanthropy, philanthropy stepped up and said there we needed to, to provide emergency dollars to a lot of the independent, especially independent community news outlet, outlets out there serving their community. So um, we did that. Um, very quickly soon after that, I learned that we also needed to provide capacity, um, capacity uh, um, dollars to these organizations. We needed to, to um, help them figure out how to add capacity in really smart and strategic ways. And we also needed to provide technical and legal support. So we raised dollars for that as, for that as well. Um, last May, I left Borealis and pretty soon I was being inundated by phone calls from news outlets saying, we need your coaching, your mentoring, we need the technical, uh, technical support and capacity building, building support. To continue, how can we, how do, can we get develop help around development um, to bring in the fundraising dollars? How can we, um, how should you know we need help in organizational design? Um, who should we hire first? Who should we hire second? Who should we hire third? Um, we need access to tools. We need to understand how to use data better. So I knew right away that there was this huge need, and the Pivot Fund was born to help fulfill that need. Um, the Pivot Fund disrupts and reimagines the journalism industry, ensuring equity for BIPOC-led community, or community organizations and the BIPOC communities they serve. Um, since the journalism industry is far from BIPOC-led, a fund that is BIPOC-owned and, um, and led is crucial. Uh, the fund it helps fight dis disinformation that disproportionately affects people of color by investing in trusted, culturally competent, and that's really important, culturally competent news outlets. The organizations that the Pivot Fund supports do not just write about BIPOC communities, they write for them. Um, I'm, I'm happy to talk a little bit about how we work. Um, so we, we target our communities um, of color, that's our center communities. Um, because that's not traditionally what has happened in status quo journalism. 
We want to understand how those communities consume information, what kinds of information they need, and what kinds of information would help them be more informed and engaged in this great experiment we call a democracy. Um, we employ a unique approach as, as we work alongside our grantees, setting, up, setting them up for long-term sustainability. While funders in this space typically focus on operations funding, the Pivot Fund recognizes that programmatic funding and collaboration opportunities are vital to ensuring BIPOC-led newsrooms have the full range of resources needed to grow and succeed. We specialize in grant making, capacity building, and technical support, as well as strategic consulting to donors, funders, and trade associations. So we are uh, a pool, pooled fund, and um, forgive me if you already know what, it, what that means, but we, we um, accept dollars from a wide ranging um, array of, of institutional investors like foundations but we also accept dollars from high wealth individuals. One of the things I'm most excited about is that, you know, with our recent launch, we had quite a, a great, a good showing from grassroots supporters of this. So we know that it's needed um, and we know that it's wanted. I think that a lot of, um, what a lot of these independent news outlets and BIPOC communities in particular um, see and understand is that for a very, very long time, they have not had the same kinds of um, equitable access to information that their white counterparts have had. And so they're, they, you know, they are, they want this information, they need this information, they understand this. Um, and so they turn to, to, to the folks that in their community who they know and who they trust. These are outlets that are um, seen in, again as part of the community as, dare I say, community advocates. Not, they don't advocate for political agendas or, or candidates, but they do advocate for their community. They, are, they amplify the voices um, of these community, community members. And so that's why they're so trusted. I think in, in, doing, in all my work that, you know, that I've done in journalism, um, I've learned startups are great and I, I will invest in, in, in some startups, but the journey is shorter when you invest in, in existing organizations that are already in, engaged in trusted relationships with the community. It's just a shorter journey between A to, a to B. Um, and the, the need is now, the, you know, it's urgent that we reach these communities, um, that we become better informed and better equipped to kind of handle the barrage of, of news that's, that we're being pounded with to better understand what the meaning is behind all of this, all of this stuff. And then, and quite frankly, how do we, and I think we hit on, Adam hit on this earlier, the solutions, what are the solutions? What are the tools at our own disposal that we can use to kind of shape the our own communities and respond effectively to some of the stuff that we're being, we're being hit with? Caroline told me Caroline told me I had eight minutes and I'll probably use up all of that right oh, now. Oh, again, I could listen to you all day, Tracy. I'm gonna to have to get you back as well if you can. Thank you so much. It's an uh, absolute privilege to hear you talk and your deep understanding of uh, the need for, for this kind of media. Um, a quick question from, from me first. Where did you get the initial funding from? And where are you getting it from for the pivot? Oh. Excuse me. Because I so, know I know that we would love a, an equivalent fund here in the UK. So just how did so, you start it? So I, I was blessed to have some initial dollars from a, a, a private family foundation. Um, and then um, one of the things I told you, we, we do the consulting piece. So we have done a couple of consulting um, jobs and that was been, that's been really cool. Um, we, Again, we got, we've had some more money from a family um, foundation. We're talking to all the institutional and typical traditional institutional investors, but what we are also doing differently, if you will, is that um, we're really um, raising awareness with place-based donors and donors of color about why should, they should care about this sector, why they should care and invest in journalism, why they should care about the disinformation happening, you know, taking place in Flint in their communities. 
And so that's where the Pivot Fund is kind of like our sweet spot, I guess, because our organizations are embedded in communities, the same communities that these local foundations are located in and are, are trying to support. So um, we're really fortunate to be to be to occupy that kind of gap that has been um, not overlooked, but just hasn't been fully tapped by by other organizations. Fantastic. Well, ooh, there is another question for you, but we're going to move now to the next speaker so we fit all four of you in, and then hopefully we'll have a bit of time for Q and A afterwards as well. So stay with us, Tracy. Can you stay with us? For yes. Yes. Great. Lovely. Because we're now going to move to Daniel. Um, Daniel Oash, uh, who is based in Chicago, where obviously one of the wealthiest cities in the world, um, very different to some of the communities you're funding, Tracy, I'm sure, and supporting with your capacity building. Daniel. Good morning to you all from Chicago. Um, it's currently zero degrees, wind chill 14 below zero. Um, so it's, it's cold and I'm stuck in my basement where I've been since COVID. Um, so I, I have my sweatshirt on to excuse the informalness. Um, I wanna, before I begin, I actually wanna acknowledge my colleague, Lauren Woods is also on the um, Zoom call. Um, and she's my comrade helping to stand up our, to the media um, program at the Chicago Community Trust. So actually, my, my remarks is actually easy to do because um, everything that Tracy's trying to do with the Pivot Fund is what we're trying to do at the Trust. And, um, and one of my favorite grant recipients um, actually already presented, Seamus from Black Club Chicago. Um, so you've already um, sort of been exposed to examples of what we're trying to do um, at the Chicago Community Trust. Um, let me do a couple of things just to level set. Um, I, I, as Caroline said, I am a social VP at the Chicago Community Trust. The Chicago Community Trust is a community foundation. Um, and what that means for my international colleagues is that we're place space. So we're a philanthropy that works with many donors, not one donor, uh, but many donors who commit their philanthropy to Chicago. Um, we've been around for 106 years now, and I joined the trust it's hard to believe, eight years ago, after spending a decade working for Chicago Public Media. Um, I want to tell you a story uh, about sort of the potential dangers of philanthropy. Um, and then, of course, during the q and I can respond to um, questions about sort of how we generate more philanthropic investment for journalism. When I was um, at Chicago Public Media, I was responsible for individual giving, corporate sponsorship, and philanthropy. So I, I, I was the guy who had to raise most of the money. Um, the Chicago Community Trust had been a funder of um, WBEZ, which is the NPR affiliate here in Chicago, for about 19 years. Um, they funded a program, the trust, that called Chicago Matters. And it supported investigative journalism. Each year, there was a topic picked, and there was about three, four million dollars sort of put into local journalists to sort of cover that topic. So multiple grantees covering a single issue. Um, uh, Award-winning program. Um, I received a call two years before I left WBEZ to join the Chicago Community Trust. Um, from the philanth from the trust, so I'm working at BZ and I'm working for the trust, but I'm I'm receiving this call in my capacity at BZ, and I was told that the program, which was then again 19 years old, was going to be canceled, um, and that led to sort of one of the most sort of traumatic moments of my career um, because we were expecting the check actually that quarter. And again, we received about a million dollars a year to support this journalism, which supported, you know, three editors, a couple of reporters, et cetera. And so I had to actually, um, after getting that call, um, confirming that um, the trust was in fact going to discontinue its journalism funding, I had to lay off staff. It was the first time in my career I've actually had to do that. So I remember it, and anybody who's worked in management can, can you probably can understand, you know, how challenging those moments are. <clears throat> um, 
a few years later, I was recruited um, to join the Chicago Community Trust as chief marketing officer. Again, my most of my career, I've been raising money and and working on the marketing development side. And I, I decided to join the Community Foundation. Um, and quietly, I didn't say this to my then CEO, I was going to find out why in the hell did the Chicago Community Trust cancel Chicago Matters? Because we never heard the why. Um, I found out, and I'm not going to name names because this is a public event, but I found out that one of the trust board members at the time, which happened to be an owner of one of the local newspapers, killed the program. And I was told by a person who was also on that board, and this is our governing board, that when he saw the um, the package, you know, so when you're on a board of a foundation, you get a package of grant recommendations. And he said openly to the other board members, um, why in the hell are we funding my competitors? Again, he owned the local paper. Um, I, I share that story um, because it, for two reasons. One, um, having philanthropy interested in journalism is a good thing. But we also have to understand the, the challenges of philanthropy. Um, and I share that story again because that was an example of someone with an more, enormous amount of power being able to, you know, in a moment, sort of shift the winds of an institution and, quite frankly, undermine um, the, the public good. You know, a program that was providing good information to residents of a city was, was gone uh, in a moment's notice. So, um, again, I made it my commitment when I came to the trust to stand up or to sort of restart, if you will, the journalism work. An opportunity came when we switched um, CEOs and we started to develop a new strategic um, direction. And I won't go into all the details, but the, but we, as a community foundation, have a North Star goal, which is to close the racial and ethnic wealth gap in the Chicago region. Yes, that's a hairy, audacious goal, but it set, um, set our institution on a path to think differently about how we do sort of our work, how we show up as a philanthropy. As part of that conversation, I advocated, and I'm going to use the I statement intentionally because I felt alone oftentimes in this advocacy, that no matter what the foundation um, chose to focus on, be it closing the wealth gap, be it economic development, uh, workforce development, no matter what our North Star goal um, ultimately would be, we needed to create the conditions um, to drive and, and a greater civic partic participation in our community, and particularly in Black and Latinx communities or BIPOC communities, which is, you know, Black, Indigenous, people of color. Um, and and, and that, that work had to include funding journalism. Um, and funding journalism it did a couple of things. And again, this is very much what Tracy's doing with Pivot Fund. Center equity um, and be issue agnostic. Um, the philanthropy had to seek to sort of create infrastructure capacity, you know, for the work to be done. Um, and I, I share those sort of top line sort of non-negotiables with you because, <clears throat> again, I want to go back to the story. Um, when I was advocating for journalism, most folks in philanthropy said, yeah, that's good. We should fund journalism. But the next st statement would always end up being, we should fund them to cover the things that we care about. Um, so you have the donor saying, I care about this issue. I'm going to fund Seamus and Black Club Chicago to cover violence. I'm going to cover, I'm going to fund um, <clears throat> WBEZ to um, cover transportation. And, and again, what I've been trying to do in my position of influence at the trust is sort of, uh, sort of challenge that orthodoxy and create a new one. Like if you if you're a community foundation, 
and you want to, your, your, the community that you serve to be healthy, you need a healthy information economy. You need journalists to be out there doing the work. Um, and, and you need to support, and this is another point that I, <clears throat> one of my non-negotiables is that we, while we center equity, we needed to make sure that the entire sort of ecosystem of journalism um, was <clears throat> paid attention to. So last point, <clears throat> we fund community-centered um, media platforms. We fund nonprofits. We fund poor for profits. Um, we fund the regional players like WBEZ, the city centric players at the neighborhood level like Block Club Chicago. Um, we fund documentary film. Um, we fund civic storytellers. Um, and, and we do all that with this spirit <clears throat> that we want, to, again, the ecology to be healthy, but we also want to encourage more collaboration. Quick question, what is your, what sort of roughly, what sort of annual budget is going into media and journalism from the Chicago Community Trust, just to make all of us all really, really jealous here? Well, no, right, right now it's about, um, it's about 3 million now, but I, let me put a caveat on that. The potential is great. Um, we we have about six hundred million dollars of grants flow through the trust each year through our donor base, and again we've just stood this program up two years ago and some of or, uh, almost two and a half years ago now and um and because of some activity in our marketplace here um, we're getting more interest from the donors who actually have funds philanthropic funds housed at the trust so my my role is not just to sort of um, adjudicate our discretionary budget and push it out the door. But my job at the Community Foundation is to influence other donors who rely on the trust to help guide their philanthropic strategies. And many, many of those donors are now becoming more interested, as was noted earlier, in funding journalism. Yep. And one more quick question, the chair's privilege to ask a question. If you were advising all your, when you advise the organizations in the community, the media organizations, what's the one thing they should do better to, to get philanthropic funding that isn't dangerous, you know, that is neutral? What, what, should they be telling their impact story better or what, what's the, what are they not doing well enough to justify getting this money? Again, I, my, my context is Chicago and, and, and I think our, our, in Chicago, our, for-profit and non-profit players do a good job of doing their work and telling their story. I actually think, just let me just say this, I think it's philanthropy's job to go out and find the folks doing their work. <laughs> and then you, oftentimes you sit in these environments and say, well, what, what should the nonprofit do, you know, to get the attention of philanthropy? And I think that's, a, again, an orthodoxy that needs to be challenged. And, and I'm, I'm working to do that. Now that said, you know, you're trying to raise money, right? And, and so the, for, I tell folks, be aggressive, particularly those smaller outlets that are startups, particularly those that are led by um, BIPOC leaders, you have to be aggressive. Now, and, and let me just say this, Caroline, one of the challenges, and, and I'm dealing with this head on, there's an infrastructure built for some legacy media that yes, is nonprofit, but have sort of built up a, some muscle. So like NPR, again, I love NPR. I worked for NPR for years. I love it. So this is not an indictment. But they have the same type of development muscle that compares to some of our elite universities, like University of Chicago, Harvard, Princeton, Yale. They, they have capacity to raise money. And these folks are aggressive. And I understand why. I had to do the job. I had a monthly goal. I used to have to raise about $4 million a month when I was at WBEZ. Um, so I understand. So they're very, very aggressive. I'm saying to the smaller players who sometimes aren't as naturally aggressive, be equally aggressive. I'm also saying to philanthropy, um, um, don't be lazy. I was going to curse. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I had to catch myself. Don't be lazy. Don't just um, respond to the inbound. Um, and don't just respond to the, 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 
the inbound that may feel new, but they're spinoff of sort of existing infrastructure. Um, so, the, so Seamus was mentioning earlier, there are a lot of folks starting nonprofit platforms. Many of these folks have connections into the corporate world of media, corporate media world, or they kind of came of age in that infrastructure. They have lots of social capital and that's great. And again, you should, you should, you should engage, but don't stop there. I, and, and so I spent a lot of time working with, again with my team at the trust saying, we got to go out and find the people we should be funding. And that's, that should be the, again, a new mindset of philanthropy. Oh, I'm going to have to stop you there. Oh, um, okay. um, because we've got two more speakers in this session who are just mm -hmm. uh, including Vince. Thank you so much. Stay with us. We'll come back to you with more questions. Can you stay with us? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so we're going to move now to, to Padma Priya. Padma has very kindly stepped in because Sunil, who was going to be speaking, has got COVID really badly and is not, not very well at all. So Padma is, is, is going to speak about what it's like to be on the receiving end of investment, but also to tell the story of Suno India. Over to you, Padma, and good luck with your speech. Thank you so much, Caroline, for having me here. And it's really fantastic to hear all the speakers so far and so inspiring. Um, and, you know, I mean, I, I thought that I was the only crazy one out there doing crazy things. So it's really good to be in, in good company of other crazy people um, who are in this sector. Um, so hi, everyone. I'm Padma Priya. I'm based in uh, Hyderabad, India, and I'm the co-founder, editor-in-chief of Suno India, uh, which basically means Listen Up India. Um, and uh, we are a podcast-only media platform, digital media platform, and we have so far over 24 shows in four different languages and uh, our focus, our vision is to um, report on underreported and underserved um, issues. And, uh, and we are like a three year old startup. Um, so yeah, I'm from the startup space. We are not a nonprofit. Uh, it's really difficult to be a nonprofit in India. It's easier to be a for profit in India. So we are a for profit company um, doing no profit. Um, just for the sake of setup, we are a for profit. And um, yeah, so just a little bit in terms of uh, Suno India. So when we started off, we started off with one podcast, um, which was on child adoption um, called Dear Puri. And um, the idea was to sort of bring the story. Uh, so adoption is a very taboo topic still in India. Um, and it comes and we have a daughter whom we have adopted. And one of the things that we noticed was that there was a very little and or little to no conversation around adoption in India. And we thought, Let's take this and that's how, uh, when we got the idea of Suno India, we thought let's start off with this because it was something very close to us. Um, and we wanted to root it in the, in the whole spirit of storytelling um, idea. And that's how Dear Pari uh, was born. Pari is the nickname that we have for our daughter. Um, and that took off pretty well. And, uh, you know, we took that idea and we went to uh, IPSMF, which is the Independent uh, Public Spirited Media Foundation here in India. Um, and they were like, oh, yeah, this sounds like a great idea, but this sounds more like a passion project. Um, come back to us with proof of concept. Now, all the three co-founders, none of us have any sort of uh, background in business management, fundraising. All three of us come from uh, very different facets. Um, so the other co-founder is my husband, um, my partner. He comes from a climate change advocacy background. And the other co-founder is Tarun Nirvan. He uh, was my colleague at Doctors Without Borders and he's the digital person, the digital lead and the brain behind all the tech things for us. Um, and so we were like, okay, so we need to prove this concept. And, uh, you know, we had a great idea, but how do you sort of implement it? And, uh, you know, it was 2019, it was the Indian elections, very crazy time. And we thought, okay, what better way to prove this concept than to launch podcasts um, in three different languages um on elections in india and so that's what we did we collaborated with people um we tied up with the wire uh, which had by then been a pretty established player in the digital media space uh, to launch a urdu podcast um and uh, then we launched another we tied up with a local tamil podcaster it's tamil is another regional language in india and we tied up with, with him to launch a region specific podcast in his language um, and another one called the Suno India show, which is now our flagship current affairs show in which we started off with English, you know, current affairs uh, podcast and also another one called Every Vote Matters. And the idea behind that was to sort of educate people about 
how the voting rights even came because people take it for so much for granted when you know when it comes to elections and you know sort of voting and so on so yeah and that's how we launched our podcast um we went a bit crazy we i think went ahead and launched like five podcasts in a span of two months um tied up with collaborated with different people and then you know at the end of it we went to ipsmf and we said hey here's a proof of concept uh this is what we've been able to do and it was just three of us with three other contributors doing it um there was and we were completely bootstrapped so we were not really in a position to and you know we went ahead and told people listen we're not in a position to pay you right now but here's what we can do for you in return you know we could do some consulting work we could do some other work for you um and luckily people agreed to do this you know again found like-minded people and uh, that's how we started and um went to ipsmf we came up with a sort of a business plan with this idea and we were the first of its kind in india um who was focusing on audio journalism who was focusing on audio storytelling but focused only on underreported stories and with the whole principle of you know journalism underlying at it um and yeah we we managed to get the grant uh, get the funding from them and uh, we are in the third year which is the final year of the fund so ipsm uh, the whole idea um you know they sort of believe that you know there is right now like a crisis in indian journalism because of the spread of you know tv news or you know i mean we have like i think we have 10 or 15 fox news in india you know um you know sorry if there are any fox news fans but just to give you an example um and it's not really a great space in the in that say in, in the right now but then there's also been this whole boom in the digital dawn right like there's been a huge like there's so much uh, everybody now almost owns a smartphone and it's only growing widely like you know that what we call as that by 2025 people they're expecting 500 million indians to have access to internet 500 million more indians to have so it's like a great space to be in um, but it's also the time when media ownership has become really uh, you know has gone in the hands of 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 i would only call them capitalists um, and there is the there is but at the same time there is a space if you want to to, to democratize this media ownership and ipsmf's vision is to is to do that is to support digital media found uh, to support digital media grow um and also to sort of reinvent the media in that sense and also to recognize that the ed- editor's role will always be paramount and that there has to be media independence there has to be a cre- you know credibility for that media um and the, va- the the you know editorial values have to be at the core of what drives you your mission um and so they have been supporting and funding quite a few um public interest journalism uh, ventures in india digital media foundations but they do have a cut off for the grant and that's usually um for the funding and that's usually 3 years and the idea being that we all have to figure out a sustainable way of uh functioning or operationalizing uh within those 3 years which i think gives that additional sort of boost and puts uh, of course it does put an immense pressure on you as an entrepreneur like oh my god where is the money going to come from during a pandemic but then you know um you do have to work hard and um see how do you stay true to your vision how do you stay true to your values how do you not move away from it um and yeah that's where we are at right now um we are in our final year and we are um we recently got selected for a google um uh, news initiatives uh, startup lab where they selected 10 digital media outlets from india to sort of support them with regards to um again in terms of sustainability and so on and i'm also doing a course on you know on on literally on a management course on you know women entrepreneurship and so on so the idea being that you know we hope that by and by next year we would have a sustainable model in place um a much more sustainable model in place than what we have right now um currently our revenues come apart from the funding we did manage to get an angel investor on board um and he happened to be happens to be a very well known film producer here in in the place where i come from um he had a very successful um three part franchise movie called bahubali um and we went and pitched to him and he really liked what we were doing and he has come on board as an angel investor and you know we do hope to go um and find like minded investors because we do realize that that's the more the that's a tricky part i mean it's right now there is a boom of venture capitalists in india and like lot of startups are getting money left right and center but for us it's also very important to find the like minded 
kind of investors who will not ask us to sort of dilute our mission and vision because we're also uh, operating in a very polarized space you know currently politically speaking it's a very polarized space right now um india is also facing what i would only call as a democratic crisis right now and it's really important for us to stay independent and have our voices remain independent um we do hope to move into the into also the subscription slash membership model eventually um but i think there's still some time for that because uh, you know content has mainly been fairly free because of internet in india and it's very difficult to get people to pay for something online as opposed to something which is offline and tangible like a newspaper or a magazine um so yeah that's uh, that's about snow india in as quickly as i could tell you fantastic thank you so much for for jumping in at the last minute it's so interesting my question is um around the word journalism and news versus storytelling um but then uh so so did you when you went and pitched to IPSF did was it fine that you were a storytelling as opposed to being a news platform or a journalist platform um i think we convinced them that storytelling is very is extremely an important part of journalism i don't know of any i mean some of the more the most remembered stories that you know for us as a reader or as a consumer are based in the the whole idea of storytelling like we will remember like i will remember a serial podcast just because of the way it was told or you know i'll remember a long form article from la times for example just because of the way it was told um you know the way it was written so i think it was not very difficult to convince them on that at all actually did you were you surprised that they were putting 3 years of funding into a for profit even though they are ipsf ipsmf is a charitable foundation i well i mean honestly i heard about them through another digital media platform and when i looked up on their website and you know i read sent in the initial inquiry i think that was my first question do you support for profits and actually it does say that and yeah i was i was pleasantly surprised um uh to hear that but i i think uh i think they they are very aware of the indian context in that sense like it's not easy to be a trust or a non profit and be in the digital media space like i will need to get you know um like someone was talking about getting additional tax certificates and everything you know and that's a very cumbersome process and again in 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 uh, in india um as a media organization you cannot take any funding from outside india um if you if you're a charity so um foreign funding so um that sort of would have limited us quite a lot i mean now because we were for profit um during the covid wave we were we won two grants one from internews and one again from google news initiative and we could take that because we were a for profit so i think um they i think they're very aware of of the challenges that are there yeah we thank you so much padma and your audience what's what's your readership your listenership brother uh right now we are at um um 100000 listeners uh, per month um spread across all our shows and with very limited marketing budgets it's been a lot of word of mouth over the last 3 years um we've also received really good support in that sense because all our podcasts are very unique almost every podcast is one of its kind in india they end up getting being written up in the mainstream media so we end up you know um so the mainstream media sort of helps also increase our visibility in that sense right right lovely thank you so much is really fantastic does anyone have a quick question for padma because i know we're running over time to hear vince but um this is so wonderful to have you with us padma and it's very late in india so i don't know how long you can stay and we'll move on to hear from vince staley now vince uh will tell us all about the amazing platform uh, organization rather that he runs. Yeah. Great. Vince, are you well, thank you Caroline for Hi, Vince. inviting me to participate. It was great to see you again after your visit to to the United States on your Churchill uh fellowship. So so many things to respond to and relate to. It's great to to uh to to see all the good work that's being uh supported and and done uh, uh in communities. um so our organization media impact funders is an association of philanthropic funders who support media in the public interest that's across a broad range of media forms and formats and different types of funders mostly us foundation funders program staff largely but also trustees 
and senior executives are also involved in our programming. Um, individual donors, high net worth individuals to some extent as well, some corporations, some pu public um, benefit corporations, et cetera. Uh, but for the most part, we're talking about foundation professionals. And our uh, area of, of uh, focus has been largely U.S. domestic, but increasingly there is interest among U.S. funders um, who also have a global view of things. Um, organizations like the Ford Foundation and the MacArthur Foundation, um, obviously for a long time, the Gates Foundation, of course, have had a long interest in um, global uh, uh, activities as well as the US domestic activities as well. And so we reflect all of that. And I'd say over the last year or so, maybe two years, we've really had an increase in um, our network of funders who support um, international media and journalism as well. So I will say that that's a, a recent trend and, and worth focusing on. Um, one of the things that I will say is, you know, we serve that field, but also most of our information is available to media practitioners and anyone in the general public, as well as our um, funder community. So anyone can go to um, the uh, website, which I'll post the link to right here in the chat. Um, most of our information is freely available. Most of our sessions are recorded and you can listen to uh, the presentations, et cetera, and all of the reports. So hopefully some of that's relevant to, to your work as well. Um, for myself, I've been running this organization for about 10 years and I've got a great team. We're about six together uh, uh, doing the work. Um, and prior to moving from the board to the staff of Media Impact Funders 10 years ago, I was a grant maker for the Cerdna Foundation. Um, and that's a family foundation based in New York where the family name Andrus spelled backwards is Cerdna. That's their little secret. They've been doing it for 100 years. Um, and uh, we supported some really interesting media work along the way, including a, a really one of the proudest grants I had was a, a grant to WBEZ back in the day for um, the, the initial funding for a new voice in public radio Vocalo, which was a really, um, you know, an experimental kind of thing. It was like more of a hip hop sound, more community oriented sound um, than it was totally alien to the way that public radio was being conducted. And Chicago was such a, a, a host of innovation and WBEZ was one of the most innovative of the NPR stations. So it's great to see so much good work happening out of Chicago. And, and there's a lot of really um, pretty revolutionary funders based there um, as well. Before that, before that, I spent about 10 years at the Cerdna Foundation. I was a reporter for the Chronicle of Philanthropy. And, and in my time there um, at the Chronicle of Philanthropy, I, I it seemed like we were in a a gestation period for the professionalization of philanthropy, much like we are now in the kind of process of professionalization of philanthropic funding for journalism, for the press, for media, um, a little bit ahead of you here in the United States versus what's happening in the UK and the rest of the world. And so back when I was a reporter for the Chronicle of Philanthropy, I also had a, a bi-weekly column for something called the Third Sector Report, which some of you may have heard of. I don't know if it's still publishing, but back in the day I had a, a column where I was sort of trying to translate what we were doing, maybe just a little ahead of what was going on there. So I think it's a, a recurring dynamic where we maybe are exploring um, things here in the United States that can be helpful. And so I would just say like, I'm familiar with that. I'm available if people wanna reach out, um, you know, you can reach us through our website and I'll also post some links to some of the reports, but I'll just say just a few more things specifically. Um, I've heard the, 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 the story that Daniel talks about of the, 
withdrawing the funding um, uh, abruptly um, to from the Chicago Community Trust to WBEZ. But every time I hear that story, I continue to be shocked by the ab abrupt and uh, insensitive way that that philanthropy uh, was done in that case. And you know, we I think the field has moved to a different place of sensitivity to that. But of course, the people who have the privilege, who have the power, who have the resources, always have the ability to do it badly. And and we try to encourage them as a field to do it well. So I'll post a link later to a report that we have. Um, it's a few years old now, but I think it's all still pretty much correct, which is five things you should know, five things you can do, our five things report, which basically says, here's how you should do it. Do it with sensitivity, do it with integrity. And most importantly, if you're gonna be funding journalism, you have to make sure that you're not doing it in an intrusive way, in a way that undermines the integrity of the people that you're, you're supporting. And so um, that's, I think, one of the cardinal rules of, of, of philanthropy is not to impose your editorial judgments or expectations in a way that basically you're cutting off your nose to spite your face if you do that because you, 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 you waste your money by undermining the integrity of the out, outlet that you're supporting. And there's much more to say about that as well. I, I'd like to ask you the same question that I asked Tracy and Daniel, really. What do you think that media, the media organizations in this audience and those of us that we're supporting, those that we're supporting, should be doing better to inspire, to inspire philanthropists and funders and impact investors as well uh, to... Yeah, well, to inspire them. I mean, I think that... Uh, to reach them, to connect with them. Um, you, you know, I think that there is a growing uh, awareness um, of US funders and European funders of the urgency of supporting freedom of expression, um, uh, uh, journalism, et cetera, uh, in response to some political dynamics and authoritarianism, et cetera, in the world. Um, I, I don't know that I have a a specific, I mean, you're doing good work. Um, try to connect with the people who have the resources who are, are um, supporting that work. Uh, everything I've seen so far is inspiring, uh, what Padma was just describing, uh, and it's just making the connections. And hopefully we can all help in uh, making the connections. I think showing could, the path for that. You could be a fantastic support to us. Um, well, uh, questions to any any of the panel now, please, from all of you. And Paolo me saying each speaker has been very inspiring. Good work has been done. Innovative ideas shared. Thank you. Can I just add to the yeah. last piece of what you were just saying about or what Vince was saying? Um, I think it's important for news organizations to actually um, do a lot better better job for philanthropists yeah. who are not really familiar about, with the sector to demonstrate impact. And so what do I mean by impact? You, sh you know, we need to be able to show these philanthropists what change has resulted from the journalism that we provide to these communities. And so um, I know we've been struggling with that for the last few years because it's so philanthropy is so new to the industry, but I think we're doing a lot better job now. And Seamus has talked about some of some of what he's been able to do. But um, yeah, I think, you know, being able to make it crystal clear and, and Pat and I alluded to this in her response to me, really making it clear about how you serve your community and what how they've been able to benefit from the value that you bring to that community that you're serving or that you're embedded in. And so how do you do that? If you get emails about your coverage, save those, put them in a spreadsheet, share it with your, your potential donors. Um, if a policy or law gets changed, make sure you write about that, report about that and share it, share it with your community who and the, those donors are a part of that community and can learn learn from that. Um, if it leads to you know town hall events or um, 
the community organizes itself around some of your reporting. I think we share those stories as well, but it's, it's absolutely critical that we demonstrate the impact so that philanthropists better understand why they need to invest um, in journalism. Thank you, Tracy. That's a great place to end this I session. Just, um, I just want to add to what Tracy was saying in terms of impact. I think one of the things that um, for us really helped us also in terms of growing our name or you know under, you know for people to know who Suno India was was you know being very consistent with the kind of work that we were putting out. Um, and I think that's really the the especially in a medium like podcasting, you have to be consistent. Otherwise, you just vanish within the 100,000 odd podcasts. But the other thing that really worked for us, and this is something that I very, very truly believe in, is that collaborative journalism. I think that's the way to go. Um, I do not look at any digital media platform in India as necessarily as a competitor. I'm always open to, you know, Suno India is always open to partnerships, um, not just within India, but also from outside India. And I think that's really helped us a lot in, in terms of growing and in, also in terms of just getting some fantastic work out, um, you know, by working together with other investigative reporters, you know, data journalists, um, and now building like a network of, of journalists, uh, you know, independent contributors and others across the country. Um, and the other thing that we've, we've been, we've managed to do in terms of impact is in terms of capacity building of journalists in a very new medium. Um, so also helping them pivot into the, into the audio journalism space um, helping them understand how they can tell stories in a different way, you know. So if you have somebody who's been a who's always been a print journalist, you know, having them pivot to audio um, is a very is a very interesting curve to watch. And it's and once they fall in love with the medium, just the kind of work that comes in is amazing. So yeah, um, so there are different ways that you can actually make impact within the within the journalism community too. And I think that's something that it's very important. I feel we should keep in mind also. Thank you, Padma. Thank you so much. I'm yeah. going to hear a very quick last word from you. Yeah, and just to uh, thank you, Carolyn, just to bring your attention up, uh, the, the things fly by in the chat. So the last item that I posted was our report, Decoding Media Impact, um, which really tells you a lot of examples of how people are, are doing that, uh, doing the impact um, and the outreach and, and assessing the impact as well. So um, if you want to understand how to do it. Uh, there's a lot of resources, not only in the report, but in the related drop down in our page that is a very deep resource on strategies and approaches to impact. But thank you for letting me share uh, those resources. Okay, well, well we're, we're going to jump into this this uh, last session before the summary and next steps session, which is how do we as impact media organizations build commercial income without losing social impact? And we're going to hear from Oshin for The Better India, from Sarah Lomax Reese for Word Radio and URL Media. And we're also going to hear from David Floyd, who's doing really innovative work in London. So welcome to all three of you for this session. Tell us a little bit about Better India and how you've built up an incredible audience and incredible income stream too. So actually the Better India started, it's been there for like five, six years now. And of course, when it started as like a positive only platform, a lot of people questioned it, right? Because uh, media in general, is, is sort of, you know, um, sensational in nature, generally, yeah, especially in India. So, so the idea of it being a positive only news platform was definitely something that a lot of people opposed. And on the top of that, building a revenue stream out of it, right? Like content to monetize content in general is, is, is a difficult process, right? And how do you monetize a, an organization that's only focusing on impact news? So definitely it was it was difficult, but I think one of the things that we sort of, um, you know, stayed very clear with is that traditionally a lot of it was done through advertisements only, uh, editorials and advertisements. So of course, when we decided that because it's an impact um, organization, right? So advertisements can't just be like, you know, our only source. 
so we looked at a model wherein you know we could actually work with brands because a lot of brands and global organizations want to talk about their purpose their shared values you know and and a lot of uh, uh, communities in large are interested about knowing what brands really care about right so we thought that okay because we have built like a large leader base you know we have high engagement so how can we bring brands on board and we can actually work on a purpose together right wherein we give them the distribution um uh, to our community and they give us like you know a cause that it that they really care about and then we work on that together um to sort of dive deeper into it and sort of you know find solutions or like whatever they're looking at and that sort of you know just like that was basically where we saw great uh, sort of you know um feedback from brands that they were really interested in working with and that sort of you know our main monetization um engine if you if you put it that way and of course like um, uh, we are very clear on you know what kind of uh, content to actually work with right because when you're talking about impact we also want to ensure that whatever we do the impact is like at the very core of it right so so it is it is something that's really warming up in india because everyone wants to be associated uh, with purpose and impact and causes so yeah we we it's 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 getting better here in india the wonderful story about how dimond and his wife anurada started the better india over a cup of tea one Sunday because they were reading the, the newspapers in their kitchen and the, all the stories were so negative. How long ago was that? When did the Better India start? Remind me. So Better India oh. actually started as a passion project way back in 20, 2008-2009. Just, you know, like four years they did it just out with their regular jobs and um, they actually formalized the company in 2013. Right, so. right. And give us a few statistics because they're so amazing about the audience. Yeah, so month on month uh, across our social channels on our website, um, we reach out to over 300 million readers. Um, and it's not just, you know, yeah, sorry. 300 million. 300 million, yeah. yeah. And that's only on the base of our English website. We definitely, you know, we launched uh, our regional languages uh, like Hindi and Gujarati. You know other smaller languages that are spoken in India, and we are seeing like a constant uptick in in adoption for that. Um, but yeah, like three hundred million, and and that too. Um, so very recently, we did a study uh, at the back of the data given out by CrowdTangle, which is Facebook's uh, um, you know uh, tool, and we were actually India's most engaged uh, media platform. Um, yeah, so so our engagement rate was, you know, much higher than all the traditional uh, news media. So uh, it, it, not just about our reach, but our engagement is also very high. How much can you guarantee independence from the work that you do with brands and the advertisers? What's um, the, how much? Because because we you know we know it's always a pull. It's a pull on our TV channel in the UK. It's always difficult, really, really difficult to stay independent from any kind of income. But how does that affect the Better India with the massive audience that you've got? The advertisers and the brands must love being associated with you. What are the dangers there? Uh, we are definitely very um, picky when it comes to working with brands, right? Like it's it's not like. Oh, um, you know, any any um, organization that wants to, you know, make it like a distribution game for them. It's it's not just, you know, plain and simple like that. Um, our sales cycles also, right? It's, it's more of a consultative approach rather than just like selling them, okay, you know, this is one template, we'll do one story for you and that's about it. No, we actually sit with them, um, sort of understand their values. We tell them our values, right? That this is what we're going to stay clear from. So we have said no to a lot of brands, a lot of people, a lot of brands that you know do not match our ideologies. So, so, and and then um, we sit together and work on 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 a campaign that both of us align with. It's not just you know they because they're giving us money. It's not like you know they can have their narrative. Can you tell us a little bit? Was there a tipping point when suddenly? suddenly it became financially viable. What was the sort of, what was, what was, what was the thing that if you think about, you know, Nafisa's Muslim Mama's platform, they're trying to scale up. What, what was the Better India's tipping point? Like I said, right, like for four or five years, it was just done as a passion project, right? Like as, as the side gig. 
um, and then uh, the kind of feedback and the letters and um, uh, you know sort of emotions that uh, Deepan and Anu uh, Anuradha received over emails, right? They saw that there was a huge traction, um, and and they definitely, I think, both Anu and Deepan were very clear from the start that they wanted to scale it as a sustainable business and not just as a not for profit. So definitely, the first sale. So they got into the whole revenue just. at the back of their conviction that they really want to because both of them were engineers mba grads so they knew that they could turn this around but like the first sale actually wasn't easy so like dhiman himself made the first sale it took him like 6 7 months to just close you know one client which was boda phone so i think um it, it it took him a very long time but i think after that the kind of impact that other brands saw out of you know all the brands that it have worked with some of those um uh, campaigns get you know picked up by global publications and then you know when other brands see that so they they sort of approach us so it's it's i think it's like a flywheel effect um wherein they see good and they want to be a part of it but yeah like i think the tipping point was the kind of feedback that they were receiving in yeah. terms of mails Mart- yeah. martin has a question for you martin ask your question yeah hi um i'm just interested oshin do you find that brands uh come to you and they they sort of besieging you or do you have to go out and pitch to them so it's both ways actually i won't just say that oh it's it's definitely we definitely do pitching but uh, right now to be very honest with you we just have a sales team of three members okay that's it so so we and mostly they are just busy with just looking at inbound queries that we receive so we on our website we have like uh, an advertise with us page um and also a case studies page so when on case studies we show all the things that we have done with different brands and advertise with us we actually show that you know this is the kind of reach we have these are the people who are reading us you know the basic demographics and stuff and then at the bottom we have an uh, we have a type form a small type form that you know if you want to get in touch with us just reach out to us so yeah like we do have like a lot of queries coming in um you know with for 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 these kind of uh, brands that they want to work with second we also uh, try to make sure that we are working with you know the same brands over and over year like over uh, years so like you know there's a big brand uh, in the automotive space called mg mg motors so we are actually doing a campaign with them that's in the third year of its its uh, you know running now so it's it's the third year we have um three continuous years we work with them so it's definitely both and and now as we plan to scale we are uh, looking at getting more people in our team sales team who can actually do a lot more outbound um you know reach out to clients also uh, do you so, find that the um you engage in quite a lot of consultancy with brands i mean do you go so far as to help them tell their stories uh if they're consistent with with what you're trying to do with better india do you find yeah. that you help them tell their stories in a way that's going to be more impactful for them so it's kind of a two way thing you're also giving them consultancy as well as as well as space yeah yeah sure so so like you know like i said uh, when they come on board sometimes clients do have like a very clear narrative or or you know story or cause that they want to work with right so they tell us that okay this is what we're looking at and then we sort of come to a common term that okay this is how we'll do it we take care of their ideation to distribution sometimes yeah. the brands are not very sure they say that oh this is the space we want to work in but we would love to hear your thoughts you know how can we do it so 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 then we sort of hand hold them and walk them through the entire process Okay. Yeah, interesting. Thank okay. you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you Oshin. That's really fantastic. Stay with us if you can. I know it's late in India. Um really inspirational talk and we're going to hear from Sara now who uh I visited when I was in Philadelphia who has an amazing story to tell as well. Can you stay with us Oshin? Yeah, great. So Sara, welcome from Philadelphia. Hope it's yeah, a bit warmer you. there than it is in Chicago and maybe maybe a tiny tiny bit warmer than chicago but it's cold here too um thank you caroline for um inviting me and i'm so um inspired by oshin's um story uh and 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 uh, journey because um the question of you know how do you make 
sust a sustainable business out of this kind of mission driven work. Um, I guess I have a little bit of a different story because um, it's very, my experience is it's very, very difficult. It's a very difficult um, juggling slash balancing act to uh, authentically and honestly serve your audience, um, particularly when it's an audience that is not well loved by the corporate community or by the government or by uh, anyone <laughs> really. You know, when you're serving people who have been traditionally marginalized, ignored, um, caricatured um, by both mainstream media and, uh, you know, American institutions, um, then it's very difficult to, to, um, uh, to, to get them to, to support your work in a full throttled way. And so I'm the, the CEO and president of WURD Radio, which is a black talk radio station in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, in the US. And I'm also the co-founder of URL Media, which is a new company that uh, I started almost exactly a year ago with my co-founder, Mitra Khalida. And um, so I'll start with Word and then I'll, I'll go to URL if we have time. Um, but uh, my family owns WURD, we can say Word Radio. We, my family bought the station in 2002 and I've been running it since 2010. So Shane, when you said way back in 2008, I, I was laughing because 2008 doesn't seem, you know, that, that way back. Um, when you've been doing this work for, you know, since way back in the, in the nineties. Um, but um, yeah, my family has had this radio station since 2002 and it was struggling. It was, it was losing money, like bleeding red for years and years. And um, so the first thing that I would say in terms of how do you um, make a, a business, a viable business out of something that's mission driven, I think it really also relies on how do you start? You know, what is your business construct when you launch? And so um, if you launch with a lot of debt, it can be deadly really, because what I've found in my experience is you need a pretty long runway to figure this out. Um, at least previously, you needed a pretty long runway. And when I, when I was at this, and I've been a, a black media entrepreneur since my entire career since the early 90s. Um, and so you, you need runway to figure out the model. And so if you are saddled with a lot of debt, that could be, that could be your undoing. It took us, I, you know, the station started in 2002. It was losing money, losing money, losing money. My family was getting ready to shut it down. Um, and I had published a magazine for 10 years, an African-American health magazine for 10 years prior to the, the radio station. And so I'm one of six kids and I would, all of my siblings worked in our family business, which was a healthcare business. And I was the only one who had media experience. Um, everybody else was like, a, a one was a lawyer, a CFO, all of these other things. But I, I had run this, this magazine for 10 years and understood content and distribution and advertising and just how a media organization works. And so when we bought the, the radio station, I was, I had um, shut down my, my magazine because it was right after 9-11 and everything kind of fell out of the economy. And I couldn't continue running the, the, the magazine and struggling that uh, along those lines with the magazine um, for more, more years. Um, and so I kind of like sat in the timeout chairs, as, so to speak, and said, I'm not, I'm not going to be involved in media entrepreneurship for, you know, for the rest of my career, really, was my, was my, uh, my mantra to myself. And um, my family bought this station. It struggled, it struggled, it struggled. And I started feeling like it was like um, professional malpractice for me to be sitting on the sidelines, 
not doing anything when I was the only one in my family who had media experience. And this, this station was very public. It was attached to my family's name and it was tanking. And so I was drawn in basically to make a long story short, I got involved. My family asked me to get involved and um, I started running the station in 2010. And um, we still were struggling, you know, honest to God, we struggled until 2020. Um, the reality is that after the racial justice protests in America, um, there was this, we, we say a racial reckoning and out of, you know, out of that, that protest movement, there was this, you know, recognition that black businesses, institutions, media had been starved, had been underfunded for centuries, you know, and oh, surprise, surprise. Um, but that really made a difference. And um, so we have, we are a for-profit company, but, um, and for, for many years, as some of you might real remember, is that um, philanthropic organizations would not donate to for-profit organizations. There was this, this real firewall, like if you're for-profit, forget it. We only fund nonprofits. Well, that's changed over, I would say the last maybe five years, that's really changed. And the fact that we are situated in Philadelphia, where we have a, a, a new, a relatively new philanthropic organization, the Lenfest Institute, um, for journalism, which really was one of the first funders for WURD. Um, I was on that board. And so um, I was able to make an impassioned plea that I was like a dog with a bone, that diversity is not just about diversifying mainstream newsrooms. Diversity is about supporting black and brown owned media. That is how you really empower um, authentic voices. And so um, I feel like that, that, um, that message started to, um, started to resonate. And I'm not, I'm not saying I was the only one saying it, I'm, there were other people saying it, but, but that, that message started to resonate. And we now see philanthropic journalism, philanthropic organizations really coming out and supporting community media and ethnic media and black owned media and those things as a part of the, the whole kind of ecosystem and a way to empower um, uh, black and brown communities. And I don't know if, if Tracy Powell is still on the, the call, but she was one of the, the first um, uh, uh, people, funders who really got behind WURD in a strong, strong way um, when she was with Borealis. And that was like transformative because that was a grant that was for general operate. I mean, it was, it was unrestricted. A lot of times these grants, you have to, you know, it's very specific what you have to, um, what you have to spend the money on, but it, they gave you all the money upfront. They gave you the latitude to use it how you need it. And that was transformative you know, corporate support has increased um, after the, the 2020 uh, racial justice protests. Government funding has increased through, but that's really as a consequence of COVID. Um, so anyway, but staying true to your audience, I guess that's my, my, my biggest message. If you are and man, I'm telling you, it's hard. It's, it's hard as hell. And, and that's, that's been my experience. It's hard to speak truth to power, to talk about racial justice and to give um, people who have, who are, you know, just not empowered the power to tell their own stories in their own voice. That is something that um, is hard to monetize. It has been hard to monetize, but we have persevered and we have turned a corner and have, um, we had our strongest year in 2020. Um, 2021, you know, has been, you know, we, we were able to continue the momentum and we've grown and it's all been about serving our audiences. You know, we started an environmental justice initiative because, you know, black communities 
in Philadelphia and across the U.S. are often situated in, you know, toxic, you know, uh, areas that are spewing pollution and there's lead and, and asbestos in our public schools and <clears throat> where black children are being educated. So we started this environmental justice initiative called EcoWord. We started an, uh, an uh, economic empowerment and wealth creation initiative called Livelihood, which is really devised to address the wealth gap, the racial wealth gap by connecting um, black people to jobs, small business development resources, um, entrepreneurship opportunities, upskilling, all of those things. So recognizing like what are the gaps, what are the holes, what are the needs in your community and how can we as a media organization um, step into that space and provide real um, information and access and how do we hold the powerful accountable to the people? So um, those are, are some of the things. And then I'll just pivot quickly. I don't know how much time I have left, but um, to URL Media. So URL stands for Uplift, Respect, and Love. And it is um, a network of high performing black and brown owned media organizations from across the US with global aspirations. So right now we are a network of 10 media organizations. Um, we just added our 10th uh, at the end of 2021. It was our first indigenous publication, Native News Online, but our, 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 um, our 10 organizations cover the African-American community, um, the Latinx community, the um, South Asian community, um, Native American and um, geography, the South uh, and uh, immigrant communities. So it's, it's a really wonderful mix of uh, race and ethnic groups, but also platforms. So we're radio, we're digital, we're WhatsApp, we're all different kinds of platforms. And the, um, the revenue model, and this goes for Word too, I would say this, um, you know, you have to have diverse revenue streams. So for uh, Word, our revenue streams are um, advertising is probably the, the primary one. Um, grants, we have been successful in securing grants and uh, membership. For URL, it's grants, advertising and uh, recruitment. So that was kind of an unintended consequence. My partner Mitra is very connected in the media world and people were coming to her kind of informally about, you know, do you know anybody? Do you know people who, who we could um, hire? And um, she very thoughtfully and um, entrepreneurially said, wow, there's a business, there's a business um, opportunity here. And so URL now has developed this thriving um, recruitment and coaching um, B2B arm where we um, help mainstream media. And, then, and now it's expanded to other organizations recruit diverse talent for um, their newsrooms and their, their organizations, and then also support those, those um, uh, employees so that they can maximize their success within the organization. Quick question, what percentage of your income on Word now, and congratulations, by the way, on both organizations, amazing, amazing story. What percentage of your income is from commercial advertising, sponsorship, deals, oh. roughly, roughly, roughly? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So Word, I would say, um, I would say it's about, it's about 90% advertising. Whoa, 90% yeah. commercial income. That's incredible. Well 90% done. commercial income, yeah. which yeah. is, you know, it's dangerous. It's, you know, and, and I, I, I don't want to sound like a broken record, but, um, you know, we, you have to diversify your revenue streams because when you are kind of an agitator, <laughs> when <you're, laughs> your role is about, um, kind of, you know, and, and I think that's part of the journalism and media's role is to kind of um, hold people accountable. People can, can take their, you know, take their ball and go home. They can say, well, if you don't say, if you're not treating me the way I want to be treated, I'm going to punish you by not giving you any more advertising or not giving you any. So that's why as hard as membership is, 
we are very committed to a mem to building our membership revenue line at Word because that's where we can insulate the um, the possibility of people just um, you know saying that that we're not going to support you anymore, and that could be devastating. Fantastic, that's really a great insight. Okay, so David, let's hear from you and how you're developing your commercial model in London. So I'm, I'm David Floyd, I'm Managing Director at Social Spider CIC. We are a small uh, not-for-profit organisation based in Walthamstow in East London. And we uh, publish five local community newspapers in different parts of, 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 uh, different parts of London and also work with uh, a range of organizations um, around the UK on, on doing similar activity. And uh, we launched our first newspaper um, eight years ago um, in, uh, in 2014. Uh, in uh, in London Borough of Waltham Forest um, in response to the fact there wasn't an independent source of news in in the local area. Um, to clarify, there was, there was at that time a range of different sources of, of, of local printed news in, in that area. There are, there are a number of corporate newspapers with very little actual news content, uh, primarily advertising driven and no journalists based in the local area. They were journalists, you know, churning out small amounts of copy from call centres uh, many miles away. And also our, our local council at the time, uh, local authority published its own uh, newspaper, uh, publicising its own activities and uh, giving its own spiel on, on what, it's, what it was doing to, to local people. So we felt there was a, a quite a significant quite a significant gap in the market for for an independent uh, voice for local news but we we set about doing that with a social enterprise model which combines paid professional journalists who operate as our editors alongside volunteer contributions from people in the local community uh you know local residents or or people uh, working for, for community organizations and we uh we distribute copies uh of the papers for free across the local areas uh five local areas we're based in and we also have, have an online presence. Um, our, our income model is, as others have, have discussed, well, well, well the, 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 there's a range of similarities. The one similarity is, is very difficult. <laughs> that, that, and that's a recurring theme uh, to, to, make, to make local news work. But our income model is primarily advertising driven. So currently primarily print advertising driven with smaller amounts of, of online advertising and we also have a membership scheme where very local people pay to contribute towards uh keeping keeping the paper going i i, I suppose I, I, our starting point in terms of the overall business model i'm going to do five more specific points afterwards about the way we go about things but I, 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 our starting point is that in the uk corporate local news has been in a process of retrenchment so so corporate local newspapers have become steadily worse scaling themselves down to, to to you know areas which are profitable in terms of advertising but make no sense in terms of actual news so so they're they, you know in, in most local areas a corporate local newspaper still exists but it doesn't it doesn't publish any significant news content basically the, the 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 flipping of the model from our point of view is that rather than looking at how much money a, new, a media organisation can make from a local area and what, what is the biggest level of profit which may be extracted from that local area by whatever means. Our starting point is how do you maximise the resources available for local news in a given area and then spend them on producing the best possible local news publication. So that is that is our approach. I mean, the, the kind of five, five key challenges or processes that, that, that we look at in terms of trying to do that, you know, not all of which we're always successful at all the time are, I mean, one, keeping costs down, you know, you need to generate less income if you if you spend spend less money. I mean, it's 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 really difficult to do, but but that is that is always useful to have as a starting point and where we're able to do it, it there's, there's, a, there's a real real benefit um, from it. The second one, following on from that and kind of opposite and the thing you're balancing with it is not keeping costs down too much so obviously in, in the event you, you are 
paying people. It is important to pay people fairly, and it is important not to scrimp and save on on really really important things. You know, don't don't think that you can save money by getting your newspaper printed on the community centre's photocopier. You know, ultimately that's that's going to cause you more problems than it than it than it solves if you if you try and make make false economies. So, so, so that balance from you know don't don't spend unrealistically, don't don't you know, don't spend money on really expensive offices or flashy chairs or you know really expensive meals out, but but don't don't cut costs where they are very necessary. Um, third one is know what you're selling and why, and this is really a, a, a kind of key key challenge that that we you know we as a, a print led uh, business model are, are often facing in terms of you know being clear about who are the customers for whom that that advertising service is still relevant and useful because because there is a quite a strong residual market but there's there's some people for whom that that market has disappeared you know there's no longer a market for selling classified ads for people who want to sell their bike in the local area that stuff has gone but what does still exist is if someone who is a, a locally focused estate agent or local school or college that wants to attract people to to come and uh, come and attend their, their institution these kind of advertisers local print advertising is still highly relevant to them and also the, the fact the you know the fact of supporting local news and supporting a high quality independent local news publication may itself be be a sales a sales factor to them the 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 allied uh, point to knowing what you're selling is knowing who you're selling to uh, and, and and as i've said that is who are the kind of businesses and institutions that really need to to advertise in a, in a local publication and what are the benefits they get from that and, and for us being being clear on that and being clear about what our message is around that have been really, really important in terms of developing a sustainable model and enabling us to grow that. And then the fifth sort of broad point is getting the right people doing the right things. I mean, we started off as a very small not-for-profit organization, getting one newspaper going. We've, we've gradually built up and you know, launched five. At, at, at the point we got to, more than one newspaper we had moved beyond the point where advertising could be sold by those of us who are primarily interested in the journalism side having a go and trying to do it as best we could you know we, we'd reached the point where advertising uh, and other commercial activities needed to be carried out by people who whose skills and focus was really on that so so moving to having a full-time advertising sales team initially with one person and, and now with with three positions or three and a half positions currently, that's been vitally important in in developing a more more sustainable business model. I mean, it's not something that I'm sitting here saying we've cracked it. It's it, it, it's an ongoing process, you know, week to week, month to month of of making that model fit and work uh, on an ongoing basis, and it, it's a real challenge in local news, but. It definitely is possible, and there definitely is a way of bringing together, you know, the need for local news, the public interest need for local news, with communities' desire to have have that news available. Um, what what percentage uh, income of your setup, which is you know five newspapers and an aggregator platform as well, like Sarah's doing um, with URL Word, what percentage of your income is commercial? In terms of the the ongoing newspaper publishing operations that is 85 to 90 percent um, commercial income social spider as an organization does does other projects uh, alongside the publishing of newspapers and, and some of those are more likely to be grant funding we are grant funded we, we, we get small amounts of grant funding for kind of additional work related to our newspapers as well but it's mainly 85 to 90 percent the, the advertising income and then around 10 percent of, of membership income which is the 300 or so local people who, who contribute on, a, on an ongoing basis to support the papers i didn't realize how how much your commercial income was that's really 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 great um, so questions to David, Sarah and Oshin. Is Oshin still with us? 
Yes, hi, Oshin, I can see you now. Um, thank you, David, so much. It's really, it's really, really interesting. I, questions also about what, what what Padma said about collaborative journalism. Obviously, Sarah's now set up URL Media, which if you haven't seen their site, is just amazing. And their newsletters are fantastic. So beautiful and so, so vital. And that's what, the whole thing. If you, I, I said right at the beginning of my introduction, but how can we all work together more? How can we create a movement? How can and I'm very, very interested in this concept of aggregator platforms and partnerships and collaboration. Uh, so, so um, questions from other people though. Sarah, what would be your ideal model of income? I mean, I just, I'm kind of quite envious of you. Well, at our TV channel, we have about, now we have about 90% of our income coming from advertising. And it's a relief in a way, because the thing of grants and donations and everything is exhausting. Right? Yeah, I mean, I think there's no easy way to make money. You know, like, like that, yeah. there's, there's a myth around, you know, the, there's a reason why they call it work. You know, it's hard, <laughs> you've gotta, you gotta put in the time. I, I mean, I, um, I I just wanted I wanted to kind of pivot to your earlier question about uh, networks because um, you know the reason that we started URL Media Network was because we recognize that it's very hard to make the economics and the impact that we want to make as local independently owned media organizations that are that are black and brown serving and and owned and led. Um, so the idea was, could we um, could we be more powerful? Could we be more impactful if we um, maintained our individuality and our individual audiences and our independence, but we shared content, we shared revenues, we shared um, amplification, we really supported each other. And, um, you know, we're only a year old, so the, the jury is still out, but we've gotten a lot of affirmation and um, there's, there's momentum around this idea. And this year is really the, the year of the advertising and sponsorship, um, you know, model, really testing that out and figuring out how we share those revenues across uh, 10 plus media organizations so that it's meaningful. And, um, and so, but I, I do feel like um, if we can figure this, this, these models out, it could actually be a game changer for the journalism and media industry, um, both from an economic sustainability standpoint, but also from a competitive standpoint to be able to, um, you know, because collectively over our 10 members, we have about an 8 million, you know, reach uh, in terms of audience. Um, individually, it's, it's much harder to compete against, you know, the, the big platforms or the big media organizations, but together we, um, we have a better shot. And I think it's a better model for the world, you know, like can we as black and brown people who really are predominant in the world, um, can, we, can we come up with alliances that are, are um, mutually beneficial and really, you know, tap into this, um, this, this power. That is music to my ears, Sarah, Sarah. really, really, really exciting. Um, and I think we've got so much to look at in the UK about doing similar, similar stuff, whether it's focused on particular audiences, communities, or just our whole movement for impact media. Um, Oshin and David, do you want to say, sort of sum up the last thing and then we'll move on to the, the next session in, in, in a couple of minutes. It's been really inspiring to hear uh, Sarah and David uh, just, you know, talk about uh, how they've built, um, uh, you know, uh, impact, impactful and, you know, inspiring organization amidst all the chaos and um, constant learning and unlearning and relearning. So I think, yeah, it's, it's a very exciting space to be in. Of course, there are very many challenges that are there to be dealt with. But yeah, I think uh, we, we do have like a lot of book generation coming in now who's actually, um, you know, looking out for, you know, different diverse sort of opinions and narratives. So yeah, I think uh, it, it's, it's very exciting to be around.
do you think there's potential, you three, do you think there's potential for global partnerships, global aggregators? We'd love to uh, explore and, you know, just like, because again, right, like a story, the, the beauty of a story and storytelling and narratives is that, you know, it's not really bound by, you know, any, any sort of geographical, um, uh, any sort of construct that way, right? So, so, so as far as like, you know, the stories can travel far and wide and more people can come on board to support that, that initiative or that cause, I think the more people support that, the better it is. So, um, yeah, I think uh, looking forward to anything, you know, uh, that, you know, we could sort of potentially work together on in the future, yeah. Great. And Sarah? Yeah, well, I was just going to say URL definitely, we, we started URL with the goal of eventually being global. Um, and so it's not, you know, it's never been just a US play. It's really looking at, you know, the, this world is so dynamic and diverse and uh, there are wonderful players in every part um, of, of the world that are doing really important um, culturally specific work. And so, you know, we, we, we want a, a worldwide um, network with URL. David, did you want to add any big visionary stuff on, on that last note? I don't know if we want to add anything big and visionary, but I, I, I think just to say the perspective, I suppose, is slightly different for, for us as, as, as a local news publisher. But I, 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 but I, I would agree that we're, we're in a really exciting position in terms of what the possibilities are for new forms of media and, and more plural forms of media. And, and I think there's a great scope for some of us who are doing this work at a local level in the UK to look at the, the range of really positive examples that there are available globally and to see what we can we can take from those examples, you know, some of which you've highlighted in your research to, to build you know, sustainable and impactful models uh, at a local level here. So really excited about being part of that. We're having a 15 minute brainstorm, which is not very much time on how, what are the next steps that we need to take for the UK? So we'd really, really love uh, your top, top thoughts, whether you are based in the UK or particularly looking into the UK from America and India, where you're so much further ahead than us in many ways in this space. I mean, we've, we've had fantastic input already from you. Um, around diversity of income, around, um, around impact, around voice, around collaboration. Um, but please put your ideas into the chat if you haven't got time to say them, but we'd love to actually hear from you, especially if we haven't heard from any of you and from our existing speakers. So over to you. I think that if there are any organizing principles um, in, in terms of collabor collaborations, I would say, you know, um, whether it's uh, regionally or ethnically or whatever, I think trying to experiment with how you can work collaboratively for um, greater, greater reach and impact. Um, there are a lot of collabor collaboratives in the US right now and they're, they're more and more, I mean, nobody, nobody knows for sure how to crack the code, but I do think that there are um, there are opportunities for um, for for greater impact when you when you do collaborate, but you have to have people who are everybody's got to be kind of equally yoked. Um, they've got to and and they've got to be equally invested. And the last thing I would say is, if there's a financial incentive, that always sweetens the pot. So. You know, collaborations just for collaboration's sake can like be very uneven, but if there's money involved, that especially for local um, smaller newsrooms, money is really important. It can really um, make the, the commitment more, uh, more tangible. So- and, and when you say money, do you mean money coming in from a philanthropist or a Google News initiative or something like that? Or do you mean, the, the, the thinking, oh, if we collaborate, we can get more advertising or we can get more members. Or... I, I mean, it could, be, it could be any of the above, but I know that one of the collaboratives that we've participated in in Philadelphia is called Resolve Philly. And one of the ways that they 
really incentivize participation is that they get money from funders, from philanthropic organizations, um, which is the way that they're funded. And then they incentivize the participating um, media organizations by, I mean, they're not huge grants. They're maybe like three or $5,000, but it's, it's not just, oh, come and sit around and do a bunch of meetings and give us your best ideas. And then we'll, we'll go and spend the money. No, it's like, it, it definitely, um, you know, it, 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 it just uh, allows you to benefit tangibly. In fact, because again, I don't know about in the UK, but I'm assuming it's the same, you know, for small media organizations, local organizations, money is at the, at the center. You need money to do the work. And so to the extent you can fund and, and provide financial resources to these organizations, however, every way, every step along the way, it's going to be more meaningful and more sustainable is what I would say. Yeah, yeah. I saw some great collaboratives in the States actually, like in Detroit. Um, and it's often it's local organizations working with the mainstream media. So it's not only about financial collaboration, but it's about stories circulating. And yeah. getting more voices and stories and, and into mainstream media. Vince, you have your hand up. Jump in. Yeah, so I just want to maybe uh, elaborate a little bit on this last point, I think. Um, and that is um, maybe one of the dynamics that we're a little bit ahead of you on is uh, there's a lot of media funding going on. Um, I think a lot of people would say, like, we need to get people to move from the sidelines into the game and supporting, but actually there are a lot of funders, but they're so isolated and individuated that you don't necessarily know who they are. And so like the- In the, the, in the, the UK, funder, Vince, do you mean? In, well, in the US and probably, oh. I, I'm guessing that it's also equally true. Right. And so I think there's a tendency in that dynamic to think like we have a funder and they give a grant to us, but we're not gonna share that knowledge with anybody else on the call or any other, but we, we view that like the, the, the organization views that as a monogamous relationship, but in fact, the funders are polyamorous and they're making grants to a lot of different groups that no funder is making one check to one organization. And so I think something that might be hard for people to, to really you know, get their head around is it's better for me to you know, introduce my funder to other funders, to other organizations. If it's worthwhile work for them to support, maybe we can encourage them to do more and get a community of practice among funders who could see that the impact is valuable and that their opportunity to work together as funders um, is you know, um, something that they'd actually want to do. And I think that we've seen a, a maybe a decade of growth in the collaboration among funders alongside the collabor collaborations that are happening among the practitioners too. But um, you could maybe speed up that, accelerate that process yeah. by making some more introductions among your funders and not treating them, you know, those relationships so close to the vest. I couldn't agree with you more. I think that's a really strong thing for us to do. I'd love to bring Tracy in, if you're still there, around actually the academic side, because I think we could be doing more. I, I was very impressed by how much support was coming from universities across the states. Um, look like your mapping exercise. Is Tracy still with us or is she gone? I'm here. Yeah, hi Tracy, sorry, I can't see clearly who's here. Can you just talk to us a little bit about whether in the UK we could mirror some of the initiatives that are happening in the academic world in the states that are really effective what would you think are one or two key things that you think really really are helping like the mapping or mm. so i'm not sure that i'm the best person to ask about this i mean i'm i'm doing some research now at harvard as a as a fellow um universities as you know are kind of slow to respond to what's happening on the ground um, in journalism but I think there are some exceptions to that rule here. Um, we have um, CUNY, the City University of New York, 
who has worked a great deal in helping in, in, in working with independent local news outlets in terms of um, procuring advertising dollars from city government. So um, because of that work, now the city of New York has to spend, at, and I forget their percentage, but they have to spend a certain percentage of their advertising dollars with independent, independent um, community news organizations. So that, that was incredible coming from a, an, 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 an academic institution. The Tau Center is another one. They do incredible work in terms of um, design and learning and impact. And, and so um, I think uh, that is probably another avenue that can, you know, can be can not beefed up, but duplicated in, by other institutions. Um, Stanford, you know, I was a JSK fellow at Stanford, and they've done some incredible work as well. In fact, um, Sarah is part of their most recent cohort um, of media, independent media entrepreneurs. When I participated um, as a JSK fellow, it was the, the full year long program. And there were, I think, uh, Sarah, Sarah Alvarez, who founded um, Outlier, she founded it at JSK. Um, as a fellow, um, and there may have been two uh, two others of us, two or three others of us who were who were entrepreneurs. But now, as I think, the entire cohort at JSK um, yeah, are entre entrepreneurs. So I think um, providing vehicles um, that gives entrepreneurs space to figure out how to proceed, how to best grow. Um, one of the things that Stanford offered that I've gained so much from is that they had a center for um, social impact. So a so whole center dedicated and focused on social impact investing. And so since I was on campus, of course, that was one of the first doors that I knocked on um, to help me better understand what was needed in the entrepreneurial space. So I, I think, um, you know, <laughs> Another thing that that we're trying to work that we're working on right now, um, the University of Georgia, my alma mater, um, has partnered with a local news outlet that's in Oglethorpe, Georgia. It's probably mm -hmm. twenty minutes away from Athens. They have partnered that 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 um, small community news outlet was about to close, and so they partnered with the university students now staff their newsroom and they are supervised by faculty from the university. Now I know it requires a whole lot of um, paperwork and crossing T's and dot nines, but they formed a nonprofit organization to hold it because the university couldn't hold it. The nonprofit holds it, but they tap into the expertise of faculty and the, the, the manpower of the students to, to, to help that that news outlet continue. So there are lots of creative, innovative things happening in this space right now because of the contraction of, of local news organizations. Universities are having to step into the gap. And you can see that happening in places like Gainesville, Florida. You can see it happening in places in Texas. Um, now it's you know happening at University of Georgia and, and Athens. Um, yeah. and I mean, quick so there's lots of stuff happening. A quick question around these sort of initiatives that are working with um, the universities. Um, are they, are the universities, whether it's for, for developing entrepreneurial skills in media or for whatever reason, are they working with the philanthropists? So is there a sort of cycle of philanthropy money going into the academic support organizations, going into the, uh, the, the actual media companies going into the all the networking organizations that you have that do training and community media organizations and things like this. Uh -huh. Is it That's the question? So the, the pivot fund is trying to work on some of that pieces of that as well. But I think the best example of that is that nonprofit in Oglethorpe, Thorpe, Georgia, that established this new relationship between the University of Georgia and this news newspaper that was about to go out of business. That is so, and because there is um, a, a, a greater understanding among philanthropists that they have to step into this information gap that's resulted, that's impacting the strength of our democracy. Um, lots of people are now realizing, oh, there's money 
And so, yes, even universities are eyeing nonprofit dollars to, yeah. you know, help, you know, stand up some of their programming. And but, that, work but, that's, but that's good, probably. Other um, thoughts? It can, other... Be, it can be good. It can be good. I mean, academic, ac this, academia is, is a, it's, it's a lot of bureaucracy there. Mm -hmm. And when you're in the news business, you have to, for lack of a better term, you have to know when to pivot. You have to, you know, you have to react. You know, we got deadlines, we got stuff is happening on the, in the media landscape is crazy. And so we have to be able to respond to that quickly. And academia does not always know how to respond quickly. Yeah, so a very different culture. Yes. Um, and just quickly for um, like, Oshin and Pat Padma has had to go now, but do you think in the UK we should be trying to persuade uh, impact investors, so angel investors, impact investors, commercial investors? Oshin, uh, you, you said the vote of the Vodafone money for Dimant and the Better India was the tipping point to scale mm -hmm. it. Do you think that we should be looking at that in the UK? There's a sort of, there's a kind of rather weak invest, impact investment movement here that could scale enormously. I don't think they put money into media projects at all, into impact media. Is that something, what do, what do you all think about that? Oshin, do you want to just comment on the, the Better India experience and yeah, you know, no, with, your so Deloitte, with your Deloitte hat on as well, for your background there? Yeah, so I'll tell you, um, just from an impact investment space, I think it's not just impact investors who are actually looking to invest in impactful or, you know, uh, organizations that are actually looking, uh, you know, doing just impact work, right? So it's all the commercial investors also today, uh, they're very open to investing in impact organizations because, you know, with the, with the whole uh, for-profit, for-cause kind of organizations coming up and, just the world moving towards purpose and cause and you know like uh, brands are also moving towards being more purposeful so i think like the the entire uh, you know sort of corporate community and the investment this thing they 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 are all actually moving towards impact in general so definitely having like you know funds with impact focus helps but yeah like uh, otherwise also like you know if if you can justify um, sort of you know your revenues in, in a certain way and you know that okay it can be a sustainable stream of revenues i think uh, even the traditional um, uh, organizations that you know fund businesses should be open to it we, we now have one minute left for me to thank everybody so i'm gonna have to overrun a little bit and then we've got half an hour if you want to stay on and network and chat uh, to to each other on the chat you're really 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 welcome i want to first of all thank these amazing speakers we've had a sort of fantastic very fast deep dive but not nearly deep enough I just, into what you're doing and I, I want to bring you all back for a special one-to-ones seminars where we can hear you speak for at least half an hour but my thanks go to Martin from Positive News, Nafisa from Muslim Mamas, Seamus from Block Club Chicago, Adam from the Bristol Cable, Tracy from the Pivot Fund and Sharon Steen Daniel from the community, the Chicago Community Trust, Padma from Suno India, and you must listen to their podcasts, Vince from the Media Impact Funders Initiative, which is so unique, Oshin for stepping in at the last minute for the Better India to replace Dimant, and we wish him well, Sarah from the two amazing initiatives that you run, the Word Radio and URL Media, and last but not least, Daniel from Social Spider who, and, and your newspapers, who is developing a really interesting model. Thank you all so much. And a very big thank you to the Churchill Fellowship for paying for me and the Rank Foundation for paying for me to have the privilege of traveling in the States and India to meet everybody. I really want to help to, to thank my helpers, Sausen, who's helped with social media so much um, to, to promote this event. Subi and Gary, who's helped with the technology, and then also organizations like the Community Media Association here who've promoted this event as well. There's follow-up sessions, follow-up Fridays in February to help any of the UK organizations who want extra input and support. And also we'll be doing a conference report and I'll circulate my Churchill Fellowship report to all of you as well. 
So, I, and, and, I, and I hope that we will continue to be in touch and to do more events. And I'll be sending out a, a, a feedback survey. So please fill it in as much as you can and suggest uh, different formats, different things that we can do to create and really build and grow a movement for impact media and to support each other. I think one of the most important messages that has come across today is that sense that if we work together, and if we collaborate and if we share our vision and our practice and our joys and our challenges in doing this, we can really have impact. So a big thank you to everybody, especially our speakers, but also our delegates as well and for, for being so patient and staying on for so long. Uh, we've had a lovely chat uh, messages coming through of thanks. So please stay on now. We're going to close the formal part of the conference but if you'd like to stay on and chat and connect and share emails and all the rest of it you're very very welcome big 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 thank you to our speakers from india and the states as well